So I'm, I'm delighted to welcome uh, all of you today for this first online uh, meeting uh, between uh, ENS and ISO networks. A meeting uh, uh, dedicated to uh, pedagogy and uh, online teaching uh, practices. Um, for your uh, information, so the partnership between ENS and uh, ISO networks uh, started uh, five years ago, so gathering the uh, four Ecole Normale Supérieure in France and the seven uh, institutes of uh, science education in, uh, and research in India. And, um, and the partnership has already led to some successful uh, achievements, such as a, an internship uh, joint program for, for master students and the, the organization of thematic uh, workshops or meetings uh, like uh, today's uh, meeting. Uh, so together with my uh, colleague, Professor Ambika from uh, Iser Tilupati, uh, we will be the facilitator of this uh, meeting today. So the, the first day um, will be focused uh, on the exchange of practices on education and uh, pedagogical uh, approaches with a, a keynote speech from Professor uh, some uh, bilateral uh, talks from ENS and, and either uh, faculty members and uh, concluded with um, a panel uh, discussion. So before giving uh, the floor to uh, Ambika, I would like uh, first to thank the, the Ambassador of France in India for uh, supporting uh, our partnership. And um, so together with all my colleagues in France, we would like also to express uh, our strong support to, to India during this very uh, difficult time uh, due to the COVID uh, pandemic. And we, we are very happy to have this meeting uh, with you today, despite uh, the situation. And, and we can't wait to have the next one uh, face to face, uh, hopefully uh, very soon. Uh, so Ambika, uh, the floor is, is yours. You, you, you might for Ambika. You mute Ambika. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, thanks, Cedric. This is Ambika from Aisar Tiripati. Good morning to all participants from the French side and good afternoon to all who have joined us from the Indian side. Welcome to all the panelists, speakers, and participants to the first Franco Indian virtual meeting organized with support of the French Embassy in India. The theme of the meeting as announced is pedagogy and online teaching practices. It's over two half days, today and tomorrow. We will start with an inaugural plenary talk followed by sh four short talks today. The plenary talk will be delivered by Professor Pankaj Jalote, distinguished professor from the Indraprastha Institute of Information Technology, Delhi. He was the founding director of this institute from 2008 to 18, where he accomplished a commendable work Within this decade, this institute was ranked in the top 200 BRICS institutes. This reflects the vision, passion, and commitment of Professor Gelote. Before taking up this responsibility, he was director, as director of IIIT. He was chair and professor in IIT Delhi, and prior to that, 20 years in IIT Kanpur. After his PhD in University of Illinois Urbana, he was assistant professor at the University of Maryland before he, returned, before he returned to India to join IIT Kanpur. In the meanwhile, he was visiting researcher with the Microsoft Corporation Redmond US for one year and vice president of Infosys Technologies Limited Bangalore for two years. And his research interests are in software engineering, quality improvement and management. A prolific writer, he has published six books around 50 articles, several conference proceedings and popular articles. Some of his books have been translated in Chinese, Japanese, Korean, etc. The most recent one is the is Building Research Universities in India, which is a must read for all academicians, academic leaders and policy makers. He's a fellow of IEEE, IETE, fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineers and Computer Society of India. I'm amazed at the levels at which he reaches out to his peers, students, and public. He maintains a very lively blog, mainly on higher education in India, which is really unique in having details with relevant statistics and facts. 
Some of them are very in interesting, informative, and thought-provoking, thought and especially relevant to the theme of today's meeting, like assessing the value of high-quality education, using online courses for credit and degree systems, university education in the post-COVID world, possibilities with new education policy, et cetera, et cetera. Today, in our introductory session, Professor Jalote will talk on pedagogy for higher education, the paradigm shift. The talk is for 25 minutes so that we can have five minutes for discussion and interactions in the end. I request all participants to switch off your video and audio. You are most welcome to post your comments and questions in the chat at any time during the talk and they will be taken up in the end. With this brief introduction, I thank Professor Jalote for accepting our invitation and agreeing to be part of this first virtual ENS ISR meeting. I invite him to deliver the plenary talk. Professor Jalote, can you kindly share your screen and start the talk? Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annika. First of all, you've been very generous with your introduction. And thank you, Cedric. And since you mentioned, I, I thought I'll being partnership with French, the two books that I were converted, uh, translated to many languages were also translated in French. Oh. <laughs> I have, the, I have okay. the French version with them. If I had known, I would have brought the copy and shown, <laughs> shown it to, to, the, to the success of the partnership. Okay, so Ambika, please remind me, um, uh, remind me five minutes before the, yeah. before my time is up. Okay. Okay, let's just call out. So I don't uh, miss the guys. Okay, so I hope I hope my slides are visible. Yes. Okay, great. So there's only two things I want to talk about. Since this is the whole workshop is about pedagogy of higher education. So I thought first we'll talk about higher education program because pedagogy is about teaching how to teach well. And it is always in the context of the program. And we must understand that. And the second, we will, I will directly talk about pedagogy in terms of effective teaching and learning. Okay, so these are the two, two things, you know, about 10 slides on each other. Okay, so higher education, we know uh, that it's all after school. There are three main levels, bachelor's, master's, uh, this thing. But if you see all discourses in higher education, typically focus on the bachelor uh, degree because that's where you have the longest engagement and you're building the foundations for others. So this, all the discussion I, I, I hear also would be about uh, essentially the bachelor. So just to, though I don't want to get into the philosophy, but you must really see what is the purpose of higher education. I think that question always is a good thing to, while you can never resolve it completely, but I put down one definition, which is very close to what EU also says, to help transform a young person into a productive citizen who can lead a satisfying life, right? So we have to, we have to see, essentially it translates to, in my worldview, two basic goals of higher education. One is about professional development. You develop the skills and knowledge to be a productive citizen, whether it's computer science, whether it is plumbing, whether it is physics, you name it, you develop skills and knowledge. So the person can be productive in that way. Something, capabilities that he or she can add value to the society. But then equally important is self-growth. Lead a satisfying life. To lead a satisfying life, which could be good values, ethics, engagement with society. You know, there's a host of things, self-growth, uh, that you can talk about. Now, most programs in India, I'm not talking about all, I know there's very good programs as well, uh, focus mostly on profession. We think as if it's a BSc in computer science or BTEC in computer science, we should be teaching computer science, computer science, computer science only, which is, of course, not in line with the broad perspective of higher education. Now, the good thing is the NEP emphasizes the self-growth, the second part of it, tremendously this time. They have taken cognizance of the view that most of our programs are narrow, and very focused on profession. In any case, though, good universities, whether it's ISAM or IIIT or IITs that I'm familiar with, they always provide an environment. For you. But there are two basic goals, there could be others. Now, ideally, those goals 
of the program should be stated as, as what are called graduate attributes. That is, at the graduation time, what are the attributes your graduates have? Okay. And there should be statements about the graduates, both in terms of professional and self. Okay. These statements can be made about learning, about capabilities of graduates, etc. And these graduate attributes, now whether we state it explicitly or they implicitly are there, this is where philosophies of education and national and global context play an important role. Right? A science institute may want to focus, may want to develop very critically scientific thinking capability, for example, while an engineering institute may want to do something else. Uh, a, a theological institute may want to build the spiritual aspect of it. So, so philosophies of education, really, what is it that you are trying to develop the student? Unfortunately, they're not often clearly or seriously articulated in when we design our education programs. What are we doing the education programs for? So computer science, just teach a bunch of computer science and you're done with it. Right? And that's not a very good way to design a program. Uh, so, so I'll just discuss one or two things. But we must keep in mind, sometimes you keep seeing this demand from industry or students are not this ready. Sometimes somebody says, we must teach them this. We have to keep in mind that we have access to the students only for about eight semesters. And there's a limit of how much you can teach them, how much they can absorb. So you can't make a professional surgeon out of, or a professional, uh, professional artist uh, in four years, or a professional, you know, you can make, get them started. So you must remember the scope we have is four years and we have to develop both professional and self. So the graduate attributes, there's been generally a tension between disciplinary and general, right? So this is the breadth versus depth argument. Now my view is breadth only, which is often, for example, pure liberal arts programs would do. I think without depth in today's world, so not talking about 20, 30, 40 years ago, in today's world, without depth, it's hard to be a productive citizen. Everything is just immensely knowledge focused and complex. On the other hand, if you go deep, without breadth, it's hard to see interconnections. And no problem comes along the disciplinary lines. So both of these, in my view, are, are older, older thought processes. So I'm suggesting, and which we followed, by the way, in our, in our own program design in IIIT Delhi, paradigms for the times, I believe, for a discipline education, B.Tech in computer science, for example, or B.Sc. in, uh, in physics, the model for discipline education, which many of us follow, provide breadth, but good depth in one. So that's the T model. For disciplinary education, it's a good could this thing. And you'll see a good education program in, in a discipline X would maybe have 50, 60, some such percent of X, while the rest would be red. Then on the other hand, but there's also need and design of interdisciplinary education. And for that, you need a PI model. In fact, it should be PI is not because both legs are equal, equal this thing. That's not a good this thing you can't. Uh, uh, but what you can do breadth and good depth in one, and some depth in another discipline. Enough that you know the vocabulary, you know the problems, you can communicate, right? So you can, you can do interdisciplinary education. So we have, for example, four interdisciplinary programs with computer science, including biology, including, uh, including social sciences. We wanted to start one with sciences, but of course things have really... NEP, interestingly, insists breadth and essential. It has a lot of focus on breadth. And it supports both T and Pi kind actively. It talks about uh, you know, having two disciplines and so on, right? So both it supports actually both these philosophies. Okay, so the general graduate attributes. Uh, so, so the graduate attributes can be broken into general and subject or discipline specific whatever you teach it, right? 
So the common attributes or the general attribute, these are which all, pro, all students uh, in your uh, institute or a school uh, are expected to have. So for example, without debating, I thought I'll just give you general attributes of a BTEC program, which at IIIT Delhi we expected. This is across all BTEC programs, right? These are, so ability to function effectively in teams to accomplish a common goal. Understanding of professional and ethical responsibility. Ability to communicate effectively. Ability to undertake small research. So we are saying all our graduates at graduation time, they will have ability to function effectively, ability to communicate effectively, ability to self-learn and engage, ability to undertake small research tasks and take entrepreneurial ability to understand the impact of solutions on economic, societal and environmental context, right? Now, specifically, I want to just mention, see what is not included. Scientific temperament is not included. Something, for example, for ICERs may be very important. We didn't put it. I'm just telling you. EQ and managing emotions and mental health. Now, this is becoming very significant now. I see one of the talks that you have today itself is on that, but it's not mentioned here. While we provide support, but it wasn't, it wasn't thought of as, as an active uh, you know, goal for graduate attribute. We can think of it that way, right? Appreciation of arts, citizenship, happiness, many other things are, are not there. But of course, it's a box. Remember, it's a constraint, four-year thing. So you have to decide what to put in, what you can manage, and what not. I mentioned these because some of those may be more relevant in ISA context. Now, professional graduate attributes, now coming to that, they focus on understanding and competencies uh, relating to the disciplines. As well. So it really boils down to two things. You can look at all the vocabulary, but it really boils down to two things. What understanding will result as, an, as a result of teaching and what competencies will the student have at graduation time? Okay. Again, without going too much in detail, let's just look at what we have put down for computer science book as the discipline specific graduate attribute. So graduate attribute should be read as at the end of the program, that is at graduation time, the student shall have understanding of theoretical foundations and limits of computing. Understanding of computing at different levels of abstraction, including circuits, operating systems, etc. So this is understanding. And what abilities will they have? The student will have the ability to adapt established models, techniques, algorithms for efficiently problem solving, ability to design, implement, evaluate computer-based programs, understanding and ability to use advanced techniques. So these are, these are five we have put there. Okay? I'm not saying these are the best or any such thing. I'm just trying to uh, explain the concept using these. So you see boils boils down to understanding of some things and what abilities we have. Right? And that's and and hopefully our program design is sound that it does. Uh, okay, so now if you establish feasible graduate attributes are established, then the question is how do you deliver them? So you have all these of our graduates will have these attributes. Great, we've discussed them philosophically. We are happy about it and so on. Now how do we deliver them? The main mechanism of delivery which we have, which we rely on, is the education program. It's highly structured. But there's another mechanism in campuses, in universities, which one of the things that misses is missing in online, is outside the standard program activities. Okay? There are other also mechanisms possible. I'm just not going to talk about it. Mentorship, apprenticeship, experiential learning, etc. But let's just focus, the main mechanism is always the education programs, but there is other mechanism, predominant mechanism. Let's just spend a minute on each one of them. So education program, okay? So what is an education program? It's finally a network of courses a student takes, right? We put, we apply a lot of thought and then we somehow figure it out what each semester the students should do. There are some general requirements, they typically try to build the general attributes. Then there are program specific requirements. Many of them will build the program specific attributes. Of course, they're cross 
cross strengthening as well then there are open credits to develop some other other uh, things which may be there in the general attributes etc now program design is a very complicated task we all know that okay. so i'm not going to get unfortunately get into it unfortunately i think often times they're not derived from graduate attributes graduate attributes provide you the direction the goal of your of your program unfortunately we don't often do that there's little clarity we just sort of sit down and apply our wisdom and experience let's teach them this let's teach them this let's teach them of course it is directed towards some kind of goals we have uh, but often they're, they're driven by preferences of academics etc right? now accreditation programs nba not the program based accreditation Uh, uh, uh well so the program based sorry i meant the program based accreditations they will focus a lot on program design so they look at whether we have the uh, attributes and how is the program designed there and again interestingly nep emphasizes accreditation a lot it talks about autonomy and saying at the same time we should have accreditation okay i just want to spend one minute on outside the program there i think as an academics we rely too much on formal instruction it's almost like a self serving thing the students learn because we teach but outside the program activities play an important role in developing graduate attributes we talk to talk to graduates they do remember some of the courses but most of them would tell you how they learned outside the program <coughs> and of course that learning depends on the culture and value of the universities uh, the, the the support the university provides the on campus culture etc and that's where this aspect is going to be a challenge for online programs per se okay so this is an important but i think very less studied area to my mind it actually provides an opportunity for rethinking college education i know many universities are doing this australia is typically a uh, very australia uk uh, a very sort of education uh, they, they they take leadership in education and some universities i visited they're really thinking about not just the program but a whole university experience including outside the program as as they going even beyond that but you know you can leverage some of breaks you have to provide active support but light touch light touch it doesn't become it shouldn't become another program it is not program the light touch guidance but if thought carefully it really can help in uh, in building the graduate attitude in developing okay so i'll end this first portion of it by a suggestion it may already be that many of you many of the institutions are doing it so if so please ignore establish the graduate attributes based on current program not what you thought you wanted but based on current program what are the graduate attributes you talk to the graduates talk to them it has to be at right level of abstraction review them and then enhance them based on the current needs the world is changing the world has changed actually the covid has made it change okay so just doing this exercise i think will will really and then of course impact your program design and include outside the program learning in your overall education planning i'm not calling it program design overall education plan involve students facilitate it with light touch but do not take the view which is good but somewhat narrow that we only teach and what we teach is all the students learn no there's a whole lot else going Okay, so that's the first part of my uh, this thing. The second part I want to talk about is effective teaching of a course. So we talked about the program, and now we're going to talk about a course. A program is finally delivered as a set of courses. We know that. Okay, so teaching and learning at the program level is happening at a course level. So each course should have a well-established learning outcome. I'm assuming that's the case, which is the statement about the student's knowledge. at the end of the course and the course delivery by a teacher is to deliver the learning outcomes about 40 lectures assignments projects tests etc so the question is how do we effectively teach course okay so this is one for the last 
five, seven years, I've been giving some workshop on effective teaching, even though my main study is computer science. I got into it as director. I, you know, learned it and then, you know, we invited somebody, experts to give workshops and then I started my, even my own. This is one cartoon I really like. So I taught Stripe how to whistle. One boy sings. The other boy says, but I don't hear him whistling. And the first one says again, I said I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. And I think therein lies the dichotomy of teaching. The goal of teaching by teachers is learning by students. We often get so carried away in our own teaching that we forget that the goal, the only and fundamental goal of teaching is that students learn. Okay? And just, just to get, get uh, this thing, what is learning? Just to understand. So learning is a relatively permanent change in knowledge that occurs as a result of thinking and experience. So learning, so and knowledge is what is stored in long-term memory, not the short term. And just to clarify, it's not just theoretical. And knowledge has two portions, declarative, that's theoretical, conceptual, theorems, understanding, and so on. And procedural, skills, what can you do? After all, that also requires knowledge. And, and knowledge also means that the, the things that you can do by hand. So the thing to remember is that the old theories of the learning are gone. They established the most widely accepted theory now is in which the learner builds an internal representation of knowledge. Okay? What does it mean is that it's not learner is not learner's mind is not a vessel where we put in knowledge. No, that's not why how it happens. The learner himself puts in uh, learning knowledge in his or her mind. Okay? So the learning, this is a very famous quote, again, I love it. Learning results from what the student does and thinks. And only from what the student does and thinks. The teacher can advance learning only by influencing what the student does to learn. Right? So student learning is not something that the teachers do on students. The students do on, on to themselves, but the teachers facilitate it. They direct it, they channelize it. So the focus of teaching has to shift uh, to learning by students and the role of teacher we have to understand from lecturing and the most fancy lecture with the best slides, which is also useful, I'm not denying that. We have to think of it as, to, as designers of learning methods and environments that will facilitate learning, okay? particularly for students. So the method I may use, for example, for communicating with this audience, that's probably not the right method to do communicate with students, right? So there is, there's a whole, uh, there is a lot of knowledge about pedagogy and so on. And that's where I, I, you know, I got into this workshop for effective teaching. Okay, so the focus of teaching has to, by teachers has to shift to learning by students and the role of teacher from lecturing to designers of learning methods and environments that will facilitate learning, lecturing could be one component. From transmitters of knowledge that I, I told you, I've told, I've given a lecture, it's your job, to facilitators in acquisition of knowledge. Remember the students will acquire knowledge, you don't give it, okay? So, so keeping this in mind as to what is the goal of teaching, namely learning, and what is learning, learning by students. The learning by students is something that the student does to himself or herself, and we as teachers facilitate it. Therefore, how do we become effective teachers? The role of teachers is indisputable. It's extremely important, right? It, it, that's why the structured teaching really helps students learn. But what? how can we become more effective teachers? So first of all, the instructors must have subject matter expertise. You cannot teach a subject without really understanding. And when I say teach, you can of course teach it, but I mean good teaching, effective teaching, you can't do it. If you don't have strong knowledge, build it, okay? 
But the here is the catch. Even with subject knowledge, teaching may not be effective. We know, I'm sure you have examples of colleagues and scientists, many examples of good researchers, scientists who were just bad teachers. They had the knowledge, but they couldn't convert that knowledge into effective teaching. So you need to, for effective teaching, you need to employ effective teaching practices. And the claim is that all people with subject knowledge can become better teachers by applying methods which have proven to be effective by keeping learning as the focus and experimenting. So this is, this is something I really like that you need a subject matter expertise, which is the X axis. You need effective teaching practices, which is the high axis. Even if you have high, high subject matter expertise, if you're not deploying effective teaching practices, only medium learning will, uh, will result. So what you want is high subject matter expertise, which presumably in our institutions like ICERS and uh, ICERS and ENS, presumably all people have it. So, so therefore, they, uh, possibly they can improve by applying effective teaching practices. Okay. So that's, that's what a teacher can do. And then there is now a whole body of knowledge I, and, and one can really uh, somehow, you know, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment, but it's not only to the teachers. Teachers are part of a system, uh, of a university, of an institution. So learning by students, though it is happening at a course level and it is the responsibility of the instructor. However, every institution can provide support for effective teaching at courses level. Okay, there are three strategies one can do for this. There's many, just for focusing on. One is, of course, training for teaching. Uh, training for teaching. I have added research and that was wrong. Mistake. So, so we know that faculty, like the one that you would have and the one that we have, we learn subject matter when we do our master's, bachelor's, etc. We learn how to do research in our PhD, but we never... We never learn how to teach. We learn by put, being put into teaching, but that's not a good way. We are not put into research by, by just saying, go and do research. We are trained to do research, but we're not trained to do teach. So there are now, and now there is a lot of, lot of research. By the way, there's many journals, there's uh, conferences, so established effective teaching practices. And this experimentation is needed for local factors. And I want to just mention all top universities. If you go and search for it, you'll find uh, teaching learning centers and you'll find lists. All top universities, including places like MIT, Cornell, which have the best subject matter experts that you can think of. They have teaching learning centers that conduct regular workshops for teachers for effective teaching. They've said also, yes, subject matter expertise, we have the best. But hey, look, we are going to help them learn how to teach. It's not that deep a thing like, like physics or computer science. You can learn it easily. And so, so they, they all, all do that. Okay. So, so there, maybe you can conclude. In uh, how, how many minutes left? Time is up, but maybe you okay. can conclude. So, in I'll, I'll, so the, I'll, I'll end with the suggestion and then. So for building feedback loops, you cannot, all systems will degenerate if you don't have proper feedback loops, okay? I put down, all institutions have some, but I'll put down this feedback loop that I, we have at IIIT Delhi. Course design, peer review, early in the semester, quick feedback, end of the semester feedback, course summary, etc. okay? Effective teaching, here is my suggestion, and then I'll summarize. For teachers, keep focus on learning by students. That is one mental shift. If you can do, things will start working out better. Apply well-established effective teaching practices. And finally, this is my favorite for India. Experiment with different approaches. Make each course a little experiment, research, and teaching. It's interesting to know teaching, while, while we all recognize it is always influenced by local contextual factors, there's very little research in teaching at the college level in India. We are still learning from literature, 
by by done by good thinkers uh, across the world we really need to contextualize understand our students our constraints our challenges and so experiment you know each of us can do it for institutions i have one suggestion start effective teaching workshops with external resources and then develop it internally get going and then have people internally develop it if any of the institutions want to do it i am happy to help in this i've been doing it for it delhi triple it and including in public uh, for, for hundreds of teachers um develop teaching excellence faculty group don't just focus on research and research excellence and so on ensure that teaching excellence group is in each institution which will start compiling best practices some something that you are sharing in this workshop doesn't have to be organized in the french workshop it should be perhaps a yearly affair in the institution perhaps it already is and then i would suggest start a collaborative tlc teaching learning center for icers most of our institutions are maybe not that big to have a center of their own but icers sharing a common this thing you can start something with small groups from each institution have a virtual group hey that will be trend setting that will set the lead in the country okay let me just summarize so the two things the goal of higher education programs is to develop some graduate attributes that's the first portion an education program should be designed to deliver right out uh, so review your graduate attributes refine them and do it the second portion is about pedagogy the goal of teaching by teachers in a course is to ensure learning by students keep that in mind if you keep that in mind many things will happen course course level learning outcomes should be there and a good course design and strong support for effective teaching can help and as i said build a teaching excellence center group that will conduct workshops do some research and other things so these are so i just thank you very much uh, this is the book uh, uh, ambika also mentioned it's available on amazon but if somebody wants to is not able to get it i'm happy to send complimentary copies to send me a mail and i'm happy to help any uh, institution who wants to improve research teaching effective teaching faculty mentoring etc my only condition is i will not take any on radio and the second condition is the institution must be serious thank you very much uh, i will stop share i had some extra slides which will which are there which you can see later on. okay thank you professor jalote very interesting talk nice suggestions etc we are actually running short of time but i would like to have take one or two questions from the chat can i read out the questions to you yes please please you you so one question is from professor vijay mohan and billai his question is to what extent bad teaching can be transformed to good or effective teaching with conscious efforts or hard work especially for young faculty would you like okay. to comment extremely clear about it it's not art everybody can learn it if but you must have subject matter knowledge i'm assuming that if you have that all of you can learn it doesn't you know yes there may be limitations some people are better communicators than other doesn't matter you can improve you may not get as good as the star star teacher in your college but everybody can improve and that's the beauty of it and that's a tragedy that we don't even take it seriously please explain the fact of depth and breadth it's a very general question but if you can do okay it in- so you would have that i skimmed over it depth and breadth you know you look at a look at a ba uh, math program i looked at it when my daughter was studying uh, over 2 3 years it had only math courses there is no english course there is no philosophy course there was no literature course there is no computer science course right uh, and and then you look at a liberal arts traditional liberal arts program which will just talk about you know science communication literature science there's that and no 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 speciality in anything that was liberal arts so that was depth you become familiar with a lot of things good concepts foundational concepts depth you get very very strong in something and i'm saying both are outdated okay i think for for want of time we will stop interaction at this stage once again thank you professor jalote from all of us here for a very nice talk and a very good lively session so we we'll continue with the session with four short talks now i hand over to cedric cedric please
Yeah. So thank, thank you, you, Professor Jalote. Thank you, uh, Ambika. So we'll now move to the, our first session with talks from uh, ENS and uh, uh, ISO faculty members. So we'll have uh, four speakers. And our first speaker is Professor uh, Jonathan uh, Pia from uh, ENS Paris-Saclay. So I will give the floor to uh, Jonathan. So for 10 minutes uh, talk, and we can have some uh, Q&A uh, session after. Can you see my screen now, or it's okay for you? Or uh... Yes, we can see it. Okay, no, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, very, I'm glad to be here, and uh, I'm very grateful to the, to the organizers to, get, to give me the opportunity to uh, explain to you and talk to you about the, what we have performed uh, about uh, Shimakti, which is one uh, open access website dedicated to uh, analytical chemistry. And as we can see here, uh, this uh, project is a collect collective work and uh, I'm just part of, the, of this team, uh, one, one, one member. And uh, uh, here you can see all the, all the person uh, involved in such a project. And they, uh, they are all belongings to uh, many institutions, uh, all members of the uh, University Paris Saclay. And uh, in the context of such um, workshop, virtual workshop, I just would like to show you that it's possible to use Shimactive and uh, an open access website for uh, blended learning. And uh, in the in the right part here, you can you can have access uh, by scanning this uh, QR code. You can have access to the to the website. Uh, and uh, so, if you want, you can you can scan it. So, uh, why we have decided to uh, create uh, such a web website? Um, in uh, so this website is dedicated to analytical chemistry and uh, in uh, part of uh, uh, chemistry training, you know that we have to perform and we have to do some uh, experimentalization that take, takes place in, um, uh, in a wet lab. And uh, as teachers, uh, we, um, we, 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 we see that uh, uh, the students uh, were not um, well prepared to such a session and with valuable knowledge due to their uh, um, backgrounds. And uh, they also seem to, um, to execute some recipes. So we would like to change uh, a bit uh, the, 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 the things. And uh, we, we, moreover, such uh, sessions are um, uh, limited in terms of uh, duration, time duration, and also number. Uh, so we discussed all together um, and uh, as teachers tr try to find a way to engage students to favor self-training and to promote new approaches. And uh, even if we know that uh, it was possible to use uh, some uh, existing resources available in the website, in the, in the, in the web, sorry, uh, like, like, for example, short videos or digital lab, such resources were, were not uh, fitting very well with our, our teaching and the topics. So we have decided, in fact, to create a new uh, a website and a website. And such website, we created uh, uh, this website seven years ago and uh, by engaging some voluntary teachers and to create a interdisciplinary team uh, with teachers, uh, but also video, video engineer, uh, graphic designer, and web developer. And uh, we get some findings, fundings from the university. Basically. And we did some technical choices uh, to offer an uh, evolutivity, which is site in the future. So now, nowadays, you have an image here. Uh, uh, of the of the Chimactiv website, and again, if you want to scan this, this QR, code, QR code, and nowadays such uh, safety, basics, drugs, food, and methodology, and uh, a gradation in the level of complexity, and uh, we have now uh, you have in, in such website uh, thirty digital sheets. And um, uh, now um, almost uh, 20,000 visitors have already tried such a website for their, uh, for their course um, in all over the world. I show you now, uh, uh, I can show you now a video here and you can see that uh, you will see that such a website was uh, designed 
with a, with a convenient navigation uh, uh, with vignette of the topics, uh, color code, a, a burger menu, uh, and for and, and all sheets, you have a navigation tabs. And again, with such website, you have a great diversity of digital resources. As you can see now, uh, interactive resources, but also a time and methodology. Uh, concept and, ba and basic, and it's also possible to self assess with uh, quiz and exercise. And one other important point that can be consulted uh, in many devices, like for example, uh, tablets, smartphones, and uh, for our students. So such website um, uh, benefits, uh, uh, it's, it's a benefit for, uh, for teachers and students in chemistry, biochemistry, that prepare a bachelor or master's degree, but also for English uh, teachers, for example, to uh, teach scientific English, like for example a better and more engaged in the session and we can see it was awarded in 2019 by two trophies uh, in both the chemical and digital education uh, community which is quite important. In the it's possible to uh, use such a website for hybridation and for blended, blended learning and of course on my, my, my work can be generalized to other uh, topics and also uh, domain of these disciplines. And not only, and, and, and not only chemistry. So what's blended learning? Blend, blended or hybrid learning is teaching and teaching and so on. And uh, uh, a range of mediated commu communication technology, technologies can be used uh, during the remote teaching part uh, uh, session. Uh, like, for example, websites and uh, like, uh, for example, and the exact uh, mix of traditional face-to-face -face and online media has considerable variation. But if we follow the uh, Allen and Simon recommendation, a learning uh, to be considered as hybrid or blended needs to have a proportion of uh, online teaching around uh, thirty percent, uh, between thirty and eighty percent. So I now would like to show you how it's possible to uh, build some um, uh, blended uh, learning activities with Shimactive. So before Shimactive, the lab work and lab session that occurred that takes place in the, in the wet lab uh, was uh, half the students with you, and uh, uh, you have a two or four hours. Uh, station and of course it's a face-to-face -face. and um, the students get some results and such results at the end uh, you the the students can produce something uh, written uh, or only uh, at the end of the session or later on when we have decided to create shim active we also have decided to reorganize such lab lab uh, and try to and think about the before and after of the very lab session. Before, uh, before the session, uh, as a teacher, I, for example, events, and so that the students can the, the lab work session. And during the lab session, I provide access to active by incorporating by incorporating uh, in the statement or um, by, by uh, or given given access so that the, the students can consult Shimactive to recite some points and to be, and, and, and for the uh, after session uh, we invite to consult Shimactive. So of course, the, before the COVID, the before and during session was face-to-face -face in, in face -to -face, uh, mode. And during the face-to-face -to -face mode too, of course, uh, 
the um, uh, remote teaching mode. And um, and we decide we have decided to change a bit uh, the, the, the organization. And for example, during the before before the session, we had a course where we, uh, we inform uh, quite explicitly uh, how to use um, a Shim Active and why why it's, it's relevant for the for the for the lab work. Uh, so the good point is the fact that um, students can watch uh, during the course the the, the website. And during the during the session, we used former results because it was not possible to do any experiments, and we also decided we decided to decrease the time duration because we know that uh, online teaching is more difficult to follow for, for students. So the bad points for that is that the, they don't have their own results, and we don't have, they don't have any lab session. And for the after uh, session, uh, we had a, a coach session uh, during which we uh, discussed with the students and we interact with the students to provide feedbacks, uh, feedback and guide the students for their production. So what 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 what, what will happen during the next year or so? Um, so now we have decided to keep the good points and remove the bad points. And uh, for the before session. We keep the session uh, online uh, and we uh, keep a course uh, and we, we would like to also to add some quiz before the session for the students to, to, to be able to self-assess and for the teachers to be able to identify the difficult points and, and uh, for, 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 the, for the, um, the students. And uh, during the session, we adapt the time duration and keep uh, quite uh, short uh, time duration. And, uh, and this duration was short. Before. I'm sorry, Professor uh, Pia, we have some uh, and for the problem to hear you. So uh, as a summary, the, the evolution we did for the lab, the, the lab work is the one. So Professor Pia, we, we cannot hear you hear anymore. You? Yeah, no, there's a, a connection problem. I'm sorry. Is it better for you now? Or? Yes, okay. So, um, as a summary, uh, the, the lab work evolution uh, we, we performed uh, before, um, during, and after the crisis. Before the crisis. Thank you, Professor Pierre, for a, a very interesting talk. So, I don't see question on the chat, but maybe the, if we can take one question from the uh, panelists or, or speakers. Do you have uh, one question and you can open your mic and come and ask a question? So if, if there's no question, you can still ask, uh, um, you can still uh, type your question in the Q&A box and, and uh, Jonathan Pierre, if you agree, you can uh, answer uh, the question. Okay, um, no problem. Okay, so we'll move to the next speaker and I give back the floor to uh, Ambika. Thank you again, uh, Professor Pia. You can stop sharing. Uh, I think there's one question in the Q&A. Yeah, uh, do we take it now, Cedric, or we go to the next? Oh, we can take it quickly. Uh, can I read it? Yes, so the question is, uh, do you have any feedback from the students on their satisfaction on this blended uh, learning process? So, Jonathan, yeah. So, I didn't get the question. So, you can, uh, you can read it on the Q&A. So, it says, uh, do, you, do you have any feedback from the students on their satisfaction on this blended learning process? The blending learning, no, because we plan to do it. But uh, about the Shimactive uh, website, of course, we have uh, many, uh, many, uh, uh, the, 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 the teachers and also the, the students are quite satisfied with the with this website because they learn more and they are more prepared for the session. But for the blending learning, no, because we plan to do it, 
uh, next year uh, because this, this year it was only a remote teaching due to the due to the COVID crisis. Okay, thanks a lot. So, Ambika, the floor is yours. Okay. Okay, so next speaker in this session is Dr. Chandrashil Pagavat from ISR Pune. He is presently Associate Pro Professor in Mathematics at ISR Pune. He is also Associate Dean of Doctoral Studies. He joined ISR Pune in 2014 and has been teaching a variety of courses at the UG and the PhD level. His interests are basically related to number theory and graph theory. So today he will present a brief talk on connecting dots. Chandrashil, you have 10 minutes for the talk and we will keep five minutes for the question and answer session. Okay, over to you, Chandrashil. Thank you for accepting our invitation to give the talk. So, bonjour to my French colleagues and good afternoon to my Indian colleagues and everyone. So, please let me know if you are able to see the screen correctly and also, uh, also hear me correctly. In Yes, in case yes. there is some issue, please let me know uh, because there are some. There might be some internet issues everywhere, and please let me know. No, it's perfect. Okay, so uh, yeah, thanks. So I'd like to also thank the organizers to give me opportunity to speak here in an interesting uh, event, which is about basically many aspects of teaching. So the title of my talk is Connecting Dots, and you will see the relevance of the title in the next few slides. So let me start. <clears throat> yeah. So let, let me start by talking about what exactly I'm going to talk about. So my focus will be mainly about learning and teaching mathematics and not so much about the subject other than that because I'm basically not much experienced with actual teaching of other subjects except the kind of science subjects I learned as a student long time back. So I'll focus mainly on the math part. And the interdisciplinary word that you see here will mean something else. It will be basically within various sub-disciplines in mathematics and not so much about physics, biology, or chemistry or other sciences. As all of us have heard many times, mathematics is a language of science. And as uh, for the same reason, it, some, for some people, it appears abstract and dry because one can probably appreciate science in a better way, but not so much about its language. So this happens with many of the things like we enjoy driving the car, but we may, may not enjoy how the mechanism of the actual car engine is. So in that sense, uh, ma mathematics is often perceived as an abstract and dry subject. And uh, for the same or some different reasons, sometimes interdisciplinary approach for mathematics is often misleading. As in one can just use a little bit of mathematics and people think that it's an interdisciplinary research but that's not quite in my opinion. One should also, let's say, if one is an interdisciplinary researcher, they should also know good enough amount about the internal or intrinsic mechanism of the subjects in case. So some, sometimes people have a misconception about what is interdisciplinary research involving mathematics. So I will like to talk about one aspect of that, which is more like how various beautiful and deep connections emerge within mathematics. And it's an interesting topic, but again, unfortunately, I don't have much time, so I'll focus on some small parts of this, again, related to the pedagogy part. So I'd like to uh, share some diagram which expresses my thoughts here, and I promise you that though it is a talk by a mathematician, there won't be any equations in this talk. So if you're scared, scared of equations, then don't worry. If you love equations, sorry about it. Anyway, so uh, the mathematics pedagogy, in my opinion, has these three kind of connecting. So this is a figure which is connecting three dots to each other. They are about how, so I'm saying I, but this is applicable to any mathematics teacher or researcher. So how I learn a concept, how I teach to others, and how I use it in my own research. And always there's a feedback between things, between these things mutually. How I teach to others will in in turn let me know how I what I will learn in future, and again that will in turn uh, influence how I teach to others. Similarly, what research I do actively will be closely related to what I teach, especially in a place like ISER. And I'm going to understand it is applicable also to places like ENS, where there's a lot of blending between research and undergraduate education happens.
So, uh, just to summarize this same thing, I am sorry, is there some issue? No, please go ahead. Yeah. Ah, sorry, there was some noise. Yeah. So, the connecting the dots approach is some a term that I'm using for the following thing. This is again, this blends the, sorry, there is some issue with my clicking. Sorry about that. Yeah. So let me just show the three things and talk about that in a minute. So what I'm talking about is the following thing, learning in a broader style within mathematics, as opposed to focusing on one very narrow, very narrow branch in mathematics and uh, just sticking with that. The other part related to this is that using the concepts and ideas from the other areas in mathematics, including the research done by other people in the similar areas, and then you apply them in your own research. So that is a very important thing just to be on your own and achieve something is a great idea theoretically, but we mortals often cannot do that. We have to get inputs from many other researchers and research areas. And the third aspect, which is now related to the teaching is that you use it very effectively in your own teaching. And as well as whenever you thought of, think about teaching and whenever you talk about teaching, you use it. So this is very briefly the connecting the dots approach. And here goes my title of the talk that I try to do it consciously as much as possible in my own academic life. And in the remaining few minutes, couple of minutes or more, I will like to briefly talk about my experiences with this approach, and then we can take some questions and answers. So very briefly, I will I'll just skip this slide. This is just a description anyway. So uh, I taught a couple of courses in ISA Pune in last few years. One of them is group theory. So the people who may not have heard about it, this is a certain branch in algebra in mathematics, very active in research and so on. And very briefly, this is the this is how the course in group theory goes at many UG level places that uh, it's typically taken by maths and some physics students in their undergraduate level. And the key core of this course is about abstract concepts and theory building as against the next example that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And often it happens that whatever you are teaching, you have to take examples from other parts of mathematics and also sometimes other sciences as useful pedagogical tools. So they are not really the core part of the subject per se, but they're often useful pedagogical tools. And then one also often has to talk about how this subject is relevant to other parts of mathematics. And in particular, this group theory is relevant to certain areas in theoretical physics. So this is how one should connect ideally uh, while teaching the group theory. And this is what I have done. I'll give the next example, which is a slight contrast to this. So the other course which I taught is statistics. And in particular, I'll talk about statistical inference. So on the face of it, these two courses look very different. So the main difference is that the basic concepts in this subject are more, much more intuitive. The, the lot of real life situations can be easily cited. For example, calculate, so in the current situation, what is the transmission rate of a certain disease? And those things are very easily, intuitively describable to a lay person. Whereas there, uh, there is a like very serious mathematical foundation to this and without doing that or with doing it wrongly, that's much more serious. With not correctly doing it, the mathematical foundation part, one will again easily, one can easily cheat others in this subject. And it's very important that the student should learn the foundation to some extent. But there is a bad thing about it in the sense of pedagogy that it's often very abstract and dry in nature. So it's, it's a really challenge, at least I face this challenge that how to convince the students that this is, though it is dry, it is important. And often I use some ideas from analysis, which is another branch in mathematics and also algebra as pedagogical tools. So in the next slide, I will just very briefly mention one example where how I use it. So there's a notion of equivariance and invariance. So very briefly speaking, how things which things do not change and how the ch things which change, how do they change with respect to each other? That's the basic idea of this equivariance and invariance. And there are hidden affine symmetries. Like for example, you can 
shift something or you can scale something up or down. So these uh, symmetries are the for any kind of observed quantities in data, which mathematically are called random variables. And these symmetries, these notions are called symmetries. And then there are often questions. So for example, a question without going into again technical details of various definitions, we just ignore them if we don't know the mathematical meaning of these quantities, that there is some uncertainty in the experiment, there is some error or risk involved in a mathematical sense. And then you have to come up with some something called estimator, which minimizes the risk. So this is typically a decision theory question. And uh, the question which sub question which arises is that how these risk and optimal decision changes with respect to the symmetries. So for example, if your model change changes with a symmetry as in let's say it changes by translation or changes by scale, then how do the uh, various things associated to that change? And though it looks a very real life situation question and though it is re really coming from a statistics point of view, what I observed and many people have observed is that there are very related concepts called symmetries and invariance in algebra. And it so happens that my own research is very much related to uh, this particular aspect of algebra called representation theory and also it's used in number theory. So, and so I find it really interesting that how one applies it in actual teaching and then I've done that when I taught it. So I like to end my talk with a quote by a famous mathematician. Michael Atia. So the quote is this, should you be just an algebraist or a geometer? This sort of question he is ridiculing by comparing it with asking, would you rather be deaf or blind? So, so you understand the idea. So this idea applies to many, many situations in science or learning that within a discipline, yeah, I mean, often you ask for somebody to be a big expert or something, but if you want somebody, you ask somebody, what does that person want? Does he want to do this or does he want to do that? This is like asking, uh, your, are you willing to lose something very important? And then I think that is a good way to summarize uh, what I was talking about. And now I'd like to end. Thank you. Merci Bo. Thank you, Chandrashil, for the nice talk. Now oh, we are already a little bit late by time, but however, we will take one or two questions. There is one question in question answer. This is how can we use this as students? Do you like to comment uh, on so from, Yeah, from uh, so the question is about from a student's point of view. Yeah, not, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes. Not yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean that's a good good question because uh, so for example, students, if they are told from the beginning that this sort of interdisciplinarity within a subject or also within the broad spectrum of science is as important as being specialist. So that will be a really good thing. But unfortunately, suppose this is not told to you, then students, I think what you should do is that you should ask questions to different teachers of yours who might be experts in different areas and try to build these connections on your own by curiosity. Often it will happen that the connections are hidden and not so easy to understand. But at least if you see some little bit of spark somewhere where something is on the face of it very different from uh, the subject under consideration, but there is some nice connection and which can be built upon. And we be curious and be uh, keep asking questions. I think that's the uh, one line answer to your question. This whoever asked it. Okay, good. Maybe one more question. If the panelists, anybody has a question, either put it in the chat or you can unmute and ask. Okay. Okay, you can still put it there. We can ask, actually pass it to the speaker. So I think in that case, we will now go to the next thing. The next we are actually breaking for tea. There is a 10 minutes break, coffee break. So I request all of you to join back in 10 minutes time. All the Indian participants should join back at 2.20. And uh, French participants should join back at 10.50 a.m. Am I correct, Cedric? Yes, this is perfect. So yes. see you in 10 minutes. Yeah, please join back in 10 minutes. Thank you all.
uh, a speaker from session one, so Professor uh, Alain Finkel from uh, ENS Paris-Saclay for so, 10 minutes talk and will be followed by a question and, and answer. So Professor Finkel, give the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Do you listen to me and do you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So thank you for the invitation. And uh, I have too many slides as usual. So I will begin by a very short message. It is possible to learn emotional competence, intelligence, and I will uh, tell you how. So. Let me. Uh, so, first, uh, maybe philosophical observation, but in fact, psychological observation, which is very old, but uh, it is always necessary to recall that most of our human problems are not in the external world, but are incoherence, conflict inconsistency between our vision of the world, of the self, of the other, and the perception of the real. Uh, you can say, okay, but uh, it's not so easy to implement this idea and to reduce the difference between the reality and the image. So I list many philosophers some are Indian, some are French, and other. So I put some uh, citation you can read, and I can stop to speak to let you read. So as I don't see you, it's not easy for me to know if you have finished to read, or not, even if you read. So I will suppose that you have finished the read. And you have many people who say that since maybe 5,000 years. And a not well-known poet, Lucero, says something also like that. So he says that uh, we are full about our idea and we don't see the real. So. You will have probably the slide, so it's not necessary that you write everything. You can just listen to me and read what you can about this citation. Even Descartes, which is not necessarily well known for this idea, say makes the, the constatation that, in fact, the real power we have is about our mind and not on the reality. It doesn't mean that we cannot change the reality. It means that it's not always easy. It's more easy in some sense to change the idea. So how today do we know that's how the mind and the brain works? The, mon the most current idea about the mind and the brain today is that the mind built every time a model of the reality, a probabilistic model of the reality. When I say reality, I mean self or the, the world. Construct an image and compare every time the image which is constructed with the perception of the reality. And if the difference is too big, the brain is not happy. The brain wants to organize the future for safety, for example, for optimization, and we want to have the least difference between image and reality. So when the reality doesn't coincide with the image, you see that uh, you can stop comparison. Okay, it's a radical point of view. You can change the vision to adapt to the reality, and sure, we can act to change the reality. Why emotions are important for us? Because they show that 
a real problem for us. If there is an emotion, it's a real problem. And why it is important to solve? Because, as usual, a problem which is solved at the beginning is uh, more easy to solve, and uh, it is interesting to solve problems. So I would like to present you a simple strategy to analyze emotion and solve problems. Why students, our students, are concerned by emotion? Because they, as uh, the, the introduced speaker say, emotion occur in many domains for students. The stress of exam, for example. The pleasure, it's not always negative emotion. Positive emotions are very important and sometimes they are not sufficiently felt. So, for example, the pleasure of studying The previous student speaker was speaking about the, the mathematics, pure mathematics, abstract mathematics, and dry mathematics. But in fact, when I practice mathematics, I like it because I have pleasure. And I think it, we have to, we have to learn also students to the pleasure of mathematics and not only to the content of mathematics. I made a list of uh, students to which I learn how to manage emotion. Sure, clinical psychologists is, uh, we, we can all understand. Human resource uh, people also, but in fact, in all domains, motive, emotion are important, for example, for motivation, but also for the pleasure to learn. I think for the teacher, it's exactly the same reason. So, now that emotions are important, I don't uh, say you more. So, this is the grid for analyzing and changing about emotion that I propose. Six steps, I will describe only the four first. So first, and it is the beginning, describe the fact. If you are not the fact, and not the, if you are not able to distinguish opinion, interpretation, thinking, and facts, it's difficult to do something. First, and first, facts. Secondly, identify emotion. It's not always easy. Some, some people, some of us, sometimes can uh, make some uh, mistake and believe that they are angry, if they, and in fact, they are sad, or maybe they are both, and they forget one emotion. Every emotion has a message and a reason. I, I have, it's not random. So understanding the reason of an emotion is a key to solve the problem. And re, re, review the choice we have when we have an emotion. Because sometimes we don't see some possibility to act. The two or the fact I will not speak about, it's more oriented remediation. It means how to change, how to act. The first are analysis. So, describe the fact is a job because uh, it's a competence which is not uniformly distributed. I don't speak here not only for students, but for all people. It's not so easy to be really factual, to speak about the reality. When I say reality, you understand that I don't begin a philosophical discussion about the reality, but I will say the common reality, for example, I speak in the Iser ENS workshop. So, okay, it's a fact. So, it is possible to learn people to learn some factual language by distinguish, for example, the external fact and the internal fact. What I call an internal fact, which will be strange, is my feeling, my physical feeling, the think I have, because it's a fact that I think this thinking. It's not a fact that my thinking are true, but it's a fact that I think at this time, this thinking. So we can learn, we can train people to become more clever about the facts. So we can learn categorization to describe emotional sense by categorizing, categorizing words, which are thought, feeling, subjective feeling, 
thinking, and so on. Identify emotion. Very often, we have two emotions in the same time. So to make the job on the grid, you have to choose one emotion and to try to understand how it arrives. Understanding the reason of an emotion. So it's not very difficult. If I am anger or fear, the question is which territory are under attack? By uh, territories, I mean most often the internal territory, and most often it's my believing or the self image. It's not in the external world. And uh, okay, I have the feeling to be aggressive. So is it real? What in myself is attack? I have, I am afraid. What is the danger? I am sad. What important am I separated from? This is the universal question. And when you have the answer to this question, you have a way to, to change your reaction and to adapt. Emotions say you have to do something different to adapt yourself to the reality. Okay, so I know that 10 minutes is very it's very short. I don't know exactly how many time I have still. Probably it's almost finished, and I prefer to stop to let you ask questions if you want. So thank you. So I stop. Yeah, thank you, Professor Finkel, for this very instructive uh, talk. Uh, so we can talk, uh, take one or two questions. So far, there's no in the QA box, but. Uh, among the panelists or speakers, if you have uh, one question, unmute and uh, ask your question. I'm very disappointed. I have a strong feeling. Ah. <laughs> it is better face to face, but okay. Especially, I gave a course on, about emotional intelligence, a remote course last year during the COVID. And it's possible to learn emotions through uh, a computer, but it is not the most pleasant way for me. I see maybe a question. Yes, there's a question from uh, Yann Lee Le, uh, Le Dantec, uh, which thank you for the talk and uh, said that my students are often very scared to speak English in class. Would you say it is more useful to do this analysis at the beginning of the course or in the middle of the course? So, you see, my English is very bad, but I have found a way to speak English. It is, I, I don't listen myself. So, okay, my English is bad, but I, didn't, I don't listen. It. Maybe the question when you say they are very square to speak English, you want to say English or you want to say to speak? especially English. Yes, because they are afraid for their self-image. So it's important to say, and not only to say, to convince students that we are here to work, not to judge the other, neither ourselves. So the problem is not the judgment. We are here to work. We don't want to lose our time to judge the other negatively, sure, and ourselves. So when I speak English, I know that my English is not very good, but I focus about the content. And in some sense, it's not my problem if I am judge. If I am judge. Okay. We we have a, another question from Rosen Texier Picard. In which context have you experienced this with your students, and with how many students? Okay. So I have experienced this with PhD students because in France. They are supposed to, learn, to, to follow some course during their PhD. Um, 15 students, 10 hours. I have also an experience with master students, 20 students during uh, six hours. And I just uh, proposed a, pro a pedagogical project in Saclay University to train thousand, thousand, uh, thousand, of students, maybe thousands of students, and to to and uh, fifty colleagues 
teacher to train them how to use the grid I propose you. So I think, uh, so I also gave sometimes a course with, in an amphitheater, you know, I have not the English word, but anyway, uh, with uh, 300 people. But you cannot do the same thing with 15 people, students and uh, 300. So I have to adapt. And I, during the lecture, while distracting the class. How we recognize the emotion of a student. So there are scientific, uh, scientific results since uh, 40 years, which show you that the face reflects with a high probability the emotion feeling. I think all of us, we know that, but uh, is it better for students to make class interactive so they can share? Yes, if, if we can control negative feeling, yes, it's possible. Yes, we can improve to Nina Gogate. Uh, yes, we can improve. I will not say that we can uh, transform uh, some people with, who is very bad in recognizing emotion in one hour in a, a genus of emotion. But I think, and it's not only I think, there are scientific papers that show that we can improve our ability to emotional intelligence. I don't say that it is easy. I don't say that it is short, fast, but it's possible. And uh, without, in a framework, which is a working framework and not a psychological framework, we can work on emotional without psychology, psychology, without, um, it's a, there is a way to work with the grid I present, which is, which let in security the student and which we don't transform the, the exercise in a therapy. It's not the framework. So it's possible, yes. And I work with on emotion with syndicalists. Sometimes I work with sportive, sports people, so I work with many people on emotion, not only in university. Okay, thank you, Professor Finkel. We're running out of time, but we have many more questions. So maybe wow. I suggest you can um, answer directly on the chat. Um, okay, with pleasure. Fine for you. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank yes. You. Thank you very much. Bye bye. So we're moving now to um, our next speaker. I'm glad to welcome. Uh, Professor uh, Alain Chana from uh, ENS uh, Lyon. Professor Chana, the floor is yours. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. So I will share my screen. So give me one minute. Uh, Uh, I think you have my presentation. Uh, Karin, Ka Tristan, yes. Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. Oh, I can. I don't know how to how it works on Zoom. So we sh we share your presentation. It's fine. Ah, okay. So. If it is possible for me to share my screen, I can also do it. Can you see my screen? Oh. Uh, yes, I can see myself. Ah. Okay, and now? Yes. Okay, so I will start. So this is my feedbacks, uh, what I did during the first uh, lockdown for some people or some, yes, some schools in, in Africa. Um, so I, I, you already know the situation. So the first lockdown was very 
um, surprise for many people for many in many in most countries so uh, we observe that most universities and also primary schools or college was uh, were not ready to do e-learning so this was the case in Cameroon uh, which is my home country and uh, so uh, to cope with the situation so what people what schools uh, did at the beginning uh, was to use WhatsApp groups. So this was very difficult, difficult for students because, uh, yes, as you know, I think, uh, it's not easy to use WhatsApp to, to, to organize conversations. So imagine if a student asks a question, another student asks another question, so you have a mix, so it's not easy to follow, to follow a conversation. And also with WhatsApp, it's not uh, possible to, to give uh, an online course. So uh, it was very difficult for students. So at that time, the government, for example, in Cameroon decided to organize courses uh, on TV, but this was not uh, for all courses. And it's only concern uh, primary schools and the, the classes which are uh, preparing some exams. So it was not for all the students. And uh, as you can imagine, it's not um, possible for TV broadcasts to, to, to exchange, to, to chat with the students. So we, we only have a teacher which, uh, who gives the class and uh, yes, that's all. So this is why I decided to, to put in place some tools in order to help uh, people from this uh, country. So first of all, I, um, I make a package. So I imagine that we can cover all the different aspects of teaching with three main tools that are many popular, but I was very surprised that uh, in my country and other countries in Africa, people were not um, uh, aware of these tools. So the first tools, tool was uh, GitHub, uh, GitLab, uh, to share materials. So the teacher will uh, put their, their materials on GitHub or in GitLab and provide the link to the students. So this is a way to, to give the slides to students as in, the, in, in a real classroom, the teacher can, can print and or give the, the slides to the students. And the second tool was uh, Big Blue Button, as you know. Uh, so the first one, Git, GitHub is very easy to use. So it is online and it's free. So to do that, I just, uh, from the different uh, teachers, to how to create uh, an account on GitLab, uh, GitHub or GitLab, how to, to create a folder, how to upload a file, these basic uh, steps to, to use Git, GitHub or GitLab. And for Big Blue Button, I was, um, I, I, it, it, at, at that time, there was no free uh, online Big, Big Blue Button tool. So I installed on, on, in the cloud, a, a big blue button system with a lot of machines in order to be able to to yes to serve all the institutions. I size my my system for more than one hundred uh, institutions. So it was very costly for me. So this is why I decided later to to ask help to to some companies in France. So uh, I had the help from OVH, which gave me the possibility to, to have more machines for this platform. And the last tool was um, uh, Slack. So I uh, asked my, so the people who uh, were connected to my platform to also use Slack to, to exchange with students either synchronously or after the, the classes. 
And with these three tools, uh, people in Africa, so in Cameroon, in Burkina Faso, in uh, Senegal, most institutions were, were able to, to, to do the classes during the first lockdown. And uh, yes, I was, as I told you, I was, um, uh, I also planned a lot of uh, training sessions because people were not uh, aware of these tools. Yes, so this was my first contribution. And also, uh, I also developed a mobile application for students who are preparing exams uh, because, um, as I told you, um, in some cities, in, for example, in Cameroon, they, they, they are, there is no internet. So for these students, I prepare an application in which I included all the different courses with uh, past exams and their solutions. So I collected uh, these, the, the files from teachers, from many teachers who gave me for free. And uh, yes, so I, I put in a free download on a free download link. So a way to, to get the application. I also discussed with the telephony operator in Cameroon, so MTN or Camtel to give free access to the students when they, they try to download the application. So it was a, a, good, a good way to, yes, to face with uh, people who, don't, who do not have access to internet. And finally, so in face of this, of the success of my solution, so I was contacted by UNESCO in Central Africa in order to put in place a Moodle system for, yes, up to 8 million students. So this was a very great challenge because it was the first time in the world to deploy a Moodle system for this uh, size. So it was not easy. And unfortunately, I am a cloud researcher, so I mainly uh, rely on cloud. So Amazon, all the available uh, elastic, scalable or elastic, elasticity solutions, so like uh, the elastic file system, the load balancer, the auto scaling system. So it was not easy to to put this uh, big system in place. So I get help from people from Google and also Amazon, and we try to help UNESCO to, to do that. Okay, so that's end. So this was my feedback. So what I tried to do during the, uh, the lockdown. So the main conclusion is that, um, yes, it was a very difficult situation for many uh, schools, uh, mainly in Africa. And uh, yes, people were not uh, ready to, to cope with this situation. And uh, fortunately, we have <coughs> some uh, free systems that can be used online. And uh, yes, so we try to, to get uh, all, all these systems and help people to, to continue courses. So that's all for me. If you have questions, so I can, I can detail Yes, uh, the, the technical part. Thank you. So thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Is there some questions? Is there some questions? Is there some questions? <coughs> Cedric, I have a question. I think there's a echo. There's an echo. Maybe. Uh, Maybe uh, uh, so Hello? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think there's an echo coming from your... Yes. Uh, is there... So, Amrita, you had a question? No, I didn't ask. I think somebody else asked. It's pretty clear now. Uh, this is Amrita. Uh, yeah, yeah. Amrita asked. Mm, yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Should, I, should I just ask? Uh, is the echo uh, thing okay? Okay, uh, Ellen, great talk. Uh, I just wanted to check. So, you know, because uh, you said that the students can download it and then they don't need internet after that, uh, that means that uh, there is very little scope to uh, update 
uh, the talks or or update the material. So uh, how are you dealing with that, or what is your what is your thought process on how will you keep up with that? Because you're reaching out to so many millions at this point, which is just fantastic. Uh, but you also have to keep updating the material. So what's your plan? <coughs> okay. Uh, yes. Thank you for your question. But um, so in this first step, we didn't um, try to to answer that question. You know, uh, for example, in Cameroon, the program are known in advance. So we and, and it's the same program in all schools, and it doesn't change during the year. And yes, it's a good question for the next for for next year. Uh, yes, what we plan to do is to to periodically, so maybe every year at the beginning of the year, we we upload new versions, new material, and people ha has to to download the application again. Um, we have another uh, long term program uh, which. Um, uh, that we, we, we want to use um, yes, to, to put in every city where we don't have internet a way to in which we can put the application so by ourselves maybe by some people from the government and people can come there and download the, the, the latest version so this is how we, we plan to, to address the problem in the future. But now we don't have that, uh, that way. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. We have uh, one more question from the chat. Um, so do, do you know if there, there, there are more students dropping uh, out from school in Cameroon after the, the pandemic? Um... No, no, no. I have I, the 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 culture in Cameroon is people do like school. So even with the pandemic, they they try to to go to continue uh, keeping in touch with uh, teachers. So this is why uh, WhatsApp was very helpful at the beginning, and uh, yes, people continue to to learn using this kind of systems so yeah i don't think that uh, no we don't have the same problem as here in ens i know that it was very difficult for some students who completely yes drop off with the the, the courses i don't i don't hear about that in cameroon okay thank you thanks a lot there's also many other uh, message to thank you for your uh, your Amazing uh, contribution and uh, achievement. Thank um, you. Thank you, Professor Chana. So um, it's the end of the session one. So I would like, maybe Professor Chana, you can unshare your, your screen. And uh, thank you. So I would like to uh, thank all the speakers of uh, session one, and I will um, give the floor to uh, MBK for the next session of so the panel uh, discussion. Thank you, Cedric. So now it is time to start the session two of the meeting of our first day. So in this discussion, mainly focusing on teaching practices. So this will be moderated by Dr. Nirmala Krishnamurthy from the, who is a visiting professor at Isar Tirupati. Dr. Nirmala is interested in outcome-based active learning, chemical education, science pedagogy, and technology enhanced teaching strategies. So today in our meeting, she will moderate the practices and pedagogical methods. Thank you, Nirmala, for being part of this meeting. And now the screen is yours. You can start. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor Ambika. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. I'm assuming it's almost the afternoon for the other side of the world, too. And a very warm welcome to all of you who have joined the panel discussion on education practices and pedagogical approaches. Uh, as Professor Ambika mentioned, my name is Nirmala Krishnamurthy and I'll be a moderator for this event. As we gather here today uh, for the ENS ISA virtual meeting, we understand that our strength actually lies in our diversity. We all come from different countries, we speak different languages and have our own distinct backgrounds. However, as educators, 
we also share some common goals to impart knowledge and spark creative thinking in our students. But in a fast changing world, we come across various trials and tribulations as we strive to achieve these goals. We, as a team of educators, teach a variety of subjects across the spectrum. Each of this brings with it a unique set of challenges, and we aim to educate young minds who also tend to bring in their own diversity to this platter. Keeping all of this in mind, we still need to uh, strive to keep these young minds engaged and ensure their active participation in class. The question is, how do we do that? Well, sometimes it helps if the course you're going to teach is very intriguing. Uh, one of our panelists is actually going to talk about a course in robotics, which I'm sure is a very interesting course. I also speak from personal experience. I teach a course in forensic science, and just the very title is enough to get a lot of people to sign up for the course. That's great. Uh, you've gotten them in through the door. But once we have them in here, what can we do to keep them engaged? How do we make them think, question, and analyze? How do we ensure effective teaching and learning? The answer to all of this lies in sound educational practices and pedagogical methods. Our goal here today is to discuss and exchange our ideas and thoughts in some of these practices and methodologies that make for an enriching experience in class. The six panelists that we have here today teach different subjects, ranging from biology to math to physics and robotics. They bring with them unique perspectives on the challenges and possible solutions to create an overall better classroom experience. Uh, during this discussion, we'll cover a wide spectrum of strategies, ranging from active learning to hands-on approach to what I call going back to the basics. All right, so let's go ahead and meet our panelists. I am sure all of them are right there. So if you're there, just maybe say a hi and we'll talk, meet each of them uh, pretty soon. All right, we'll start with first Dr. Uh, Amrita Hasra and Dr. Raghav Rajan, both assistant professors at ISER Pune. I'll give a short intro on all of them before we go on to the panel itself. Dr. Hasra uses um, microbial vitamin biosynthesis and utilization pathways to probe enzyme substrate and microbe microbe interaction while Dr. Rajan's lab uses songbirds to understand how neural activity generates complex natural behaviors. Our next panelist would be Dr. Sujit, an associate professor from ISER Bhopal. Uh, Dr. Sujit's research group aims at conception and development of techniques for achieving cooperative behavior in autonomous vehicles. It's also my pleasure to introduce Professor Samitro Banerjee uh, from ISER Kolkata, who comes with years of experience both in teaching and in research. His research actually involves solving problems in nonlinear dynamics with applications in various fields ranging from power grid management to relativity. We also have Professor Dennis Tiffrey, a systems biologist from ENS Paris. Professor Tiffrey's lab is part of the Computational Biology Center and combines interdisciplinary approaches to model the behavior of regulatory networks. And I'm happy to introduce our final panelist, my colleague from ISA Tripathi, Dr. Venkata Subramaniam. He works in representation theory and automorphic forms, and I can personally attest to his amazing energy and enterprise in finding innovative methods for teaching in math. So now that we know who the panelists are, we are going to do kind of a virtual round table. Okay, each of the panelists will come up and discuss their pedagogical strategies for a couple of minutes. And once we are done with that in the last few minutes, or we'll go about for a panel discussion. I'll open up the floor and you can please post your questions on the chat box and we'll address them as much as we can. Okay, so panelists, please, when you're up, do uh, switch on your videos. Our first talk on this round table is what I like to call get down to basics. Whenever we envision a workshop on pedagogical strategies, people always assume it has to involve some fancy technique, some new fancy technology. However, sometimes we all have to go back to where it all started on a chalkboard. Our panelists for this are Dr. Hasra and Dr. Raghav Rajan. So on to you guys. Dr. Hasra, would you like to take over first? Sure, yeah. Thanks, uh, Nirmala, for the very generous introduction and for the lovely, uh, lovely sort of putting together of what this panel is about. Um, can I, uh, is, I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation. Yes. And Nirmala, if you could confirm that you can see it, that would be very helpful. 
say that. Yes. Uh, yes. Great. And is um, oh, it's full screen? Yeah, it's uh, full screen. screen is full screen. Great. Yeah. Right. You're good. Great. Uh, thanks so much. And yeah, so as Nirmala said. Um, so when I was, uh, I, okay, I'm an assistant professor at ISA Pune uh, with a primary um, uh, uh, association with the chemistry department and also with the biology department. Um, and I started teaching on my own at, uh, you know, a whole course on my own only once I became an assistant professor. So relevant to uh, a couple of the talks and also what uh, uh, Dr. Jaloti said right at the beginning, uh, this is, you know, where you get thrown into the the, the, the deep end of the pool often. And I uh, initially struggled with, you know, what techniques to use. Should I, you know, use all these the modern methods that I was encountering? But over, uh, you know, six uh, years of teaching and having taught uh, the courses over and over again, I have actually come down to uh, working with the chalkboard in teaching advanced classes. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my approach. And as Nirmala has beautifully phrased it, it is back to the basics because I've just come, I've sort of come a full circle in this. Uh, so yeah, so why I teach advanced classes in chemistry and biology using the uh, chalkboard is what uh, I'm going to tell you about. Uh, so I feel that the blackboard is very rele relevant even today. Uh, and the reasons uh, why I feel it is because, uh, let's just analyze what the main difference is between chalkboard teaching and uh, using other methods, slides or videos or, or other audiovisual methods are. So one of the most commonly uh, sort of thought of points is that it slows you down. It slows uh, you down as a teacher and it slows down the thought process and uh, the style of delivering the material for the student. So that is one of the most commonly thought of points. The second one is distilling concepts, which I'll briefly mention. And the third point is about noting subtleties and what we do not know. And I will talk about these uh, shortly in the next uh, few slides. Uh, so what I mean by slowing down, I already mentioned, and this is actually rather well uh, uh, sort of discussed that, you know, it helps uh, both the teacher and the student to assimilate at a slower pace. Um, it allows students to write notes in real time. So while teaching uh, on Blackboard, most of us will not be providing extra notes. And so it helps the student to write in real time and also process the material in real time. And also it makes uh, our engagements as in question answer form more uh, more interactive uh, because you're drawing on the board and you know you're making these funny faces sometimes because you know you made a mistake the student is pointing out a mistake things like that really help but I think uh, you know these are probably uh, also points that many of us uh, and probably uh, points that I think Raghav will also probably discuss in greater detail. Um, Another thing that I feel really uh, works for me is that I have limited space on the blackboard. Uh, so I distill how I am going to present a concept and that allows me to understand what are the most important parts of what I want to tell the student, what I want them to carry home. And I use my homework assignments as a way for them to try out that concept in various uh, 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 versions of problems. And so that is the other thing that I feel is uh, it's very useful for me where the blackboard is a tool. It is not only allowing me to distill concepts, it's allowing me to give them just the right amount of uh, tools that they need to be able to address a much wider range of questions, uh, which come in various flavors, but often are just bells and whistles of the same basic concept that you uh, teach or you learn, uh, and then you build on it. You build build the bell, you build the whistle, and then and and then. But what is most important is that you understood where it all started. So that is what I mean by distilling concepts and how the blackboard enables that. And the third one I feel is most important for what uh, I do, which is that um, I feel like you know at the first and second years when at ISA Pune it's a five year undergraduate program. And uh, where they leave with a master's degree at the end of the five years, but they come in after their 12th grade. And uh, many of them are coming in from math backgrounds, physics backgrounds, chemistry backgrounds, bio backgrounds, and where they don't have, what I mean by that is they don't have enough knowledge on the other topics. So like, you know, a physics guy may not know enough about biology and vice versa. They would have dropped these courses along the way, even up till 12th uh, grade in India. So uh, they need to have a gross view or a big picture view of the phenomena that are happening in the natural world. 
and a lot of that can be provided very powerfully using videos and new teaching techniques uh, and tools which uh, allow the student to have a bigger picture understanding or a breadth of the topic and i feel it's very important to do that in the first and second years but i feel that the advanced classes are the time to go into depth uh, this is again a point that uh, professor jalote made in his keynote talk today that the depth is also very important and that is where blackboard teaching i think really helps because it allows you to uh, you know draw if you have to draw the details of a process you have to understand the depth and you have to question the depth and there is no space for understand or leaving gaps and secondly it allows the student to know that even though i saw this beautiful video of how say you know dna uh, replication happens uh, when i'm asking questions to my teacher they are telling me but this is not known and that is not known so these are active areas of research even today so even though i saw this beautiful video that seems to you know tell me that i know everything it's not true so i think those are uh, things that blackboard teaching really has helped me with in communicating to advanced students and in advanced courses that there is still so much to know there is still so much research questions available even in the most basic of topics uh, i want to conclude with an example of what i do in my own class it's chem 431 called chemical biology uh, i have introduced the why question seminar to be able to introduce students to this idea of these big picture yet unanswered questions which may have passed them by in their first and second years and uh, it allows them to know that even this is not known and some i've just quickly uh, summarized a few uh, questions uh, mostly biology and chemistry related so for example most of us have heard that uh, atp is the energy currency of your uh, system of your biological systems of your human body but why atp why not gtp why not any other molecule why did nature choose atp to be the energy currency Uh, or in a uh, DNA or RNA, why is there a ribose ring? Why is there no other sugar? Uh, or you know, in the case of the pandemic today, where COVID nineteen is a, a RNA based virus, why are there RNA based? Uh, I mean, why are there viruses which use RNA where DNA is so much more stable? Why shouldn't uh, you know everything be using DNA just like humans do, just like other organisms do? So these are the kind of questions that my students have come up with in the class and tried to answer, and this has led them to exciting research projects during their. phd uh, so i would like to stop here and i'm um, i'm happy to uh, take questions or I, i would happy to get contributions from people uh, in uh, who are listening uh, in the future thanks so much thank you dr hasra uh, dr rajan can you take over please? so if you have any comments questions please put them in the chat box and uh, we will take it at the end of uh, the talk by all the panelists yes can you mostly hear me? in the interest of time Yes. Can you, uh, can you take this down? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, Amita, can you take this down? Yes, I'm just trying to get out of the share mode. Uh, okay. So sorry for the fumbling with this. Um, uh, can actually the host just uh, stop? My, okay, here I can stop sharing here. Okay. Okay, I'm out. Thanks. Yes, Dr. Rajan, you can go ahead. Okay. Let me try and get my screen up. Can you see my screen? Not yet, but it should. Now? Yeah, it's just started. Um, it started? Uh, yes. Okay. 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 So, uh, and you can hear me clearly, right? Yes. Yes, I can. Yeah. So, thank you very much, Nimla, and thank you uh, to all the others who organized this and you know giving me an opportunity to talk here. Uh, I think Amrita asked me about this a few months ago, and I'm not really sure, you know, uh, why I was being asked. I think. Uh, i'd like to learn more from the others about uh, good uh, you know what good practices for uh, teaching so like amrita is uh, i'm also an assistant professor at isa pune i've been teaching for a number of years now uh, and uh, i would also like to sort of um, you know say something similar to what amrita said about uh, teaching with uh, chalk and blackboard i've tried a number of other uh, uh, ways of uh, teaching you know the um, with uh, slides and with powerpoints videos etc but i sort of come back to this uh, partly because i uh, in between i taught a course on uh, biostatistics and it just made much more sense to do uh, all of the uh, biostatistics uh, with a chalk and blackboard and then i wanted to see you know uh, what happens if i try teaching neuroscience and animal behavior also with this and um, 
so I want to sort of uh, reiterate some of the things that Amrita said, but uh, basically, you know, what uh, what motivates me to teach with uh, uh, Blackboard. And like Amrita said, I think uh, importantly, it forces me to slow down. I remember the first time I taught uh, a course, I was uh, I taught something like 35 slides or something in an hour. Uh, but uh, I think that's just too fast for the students. And over the years, I've realized that, you know, 10 to 15 slides at the most is what, uh, you know, goes down well for an hour. Uh, with the uh, Blackboard, uh, since I'm also writing it, it gives uh, students also time to, you know, go through it and I have to draw it out. Um, and so I think uh, the pace at which I'm doing this uh, is sort of more, is much more, it's much better uh, for the pace at which uh, students are following what I'm uh, doing. Uh, it allows me to simplify and explain concepts. And uh, I think, again, uh, uh, what I realized was, you know, when I put in a figure from a paper or from a textbook onto a, a lecture slide, there's just a lot of things on that. And uh, uh, students tend to get distracted by all of the details that are there. Uh, whereas if I'm going to draw it out, they know exactly what I'm drawing and they can focus on what I'm drawing and they know what I mean when I, uh, you know, use a term to explain something. Whereas with a graph, if I'm just using a, a picture on the on a slide to, you know, explain something, uh, it's as I realize afterwards when you know when I uh, see the answer papers of the exams that uh, in fact they didn't, maybe they didn't really understand what I meant by this term, uh, etc. So this allows me to simplify and explain the concepts uh, much better, uh, which again, uh, like I said, is less distracting than uh, uh, you know the slides. Uh, the blackboard. Uh, uh, I mean, a little contrary to what Amrita said, I think the Blackboard allows me space uh, to, you know, um, for more spontaneity while answering questions, you know. I, I can have a slide deck prepared for uh, every class, but every class, every year I teach the same course, the same content. It's slightly different because the students are different and they're going to ask me uh, different questions. And with the Blackboard, it allows me to answer those questions with, you know, more drawings or uh, uh, things on the Blackboard. Whereas with a slide, I can't have... A, an additional slide to, you know, answer every single question that I'm going to get asked. Whereas here, if I have the central, uh, you know, a concept in the middle of the board, I can connect this to many uh, things uh, on different parts of the board while answering questions. Um, so, okay. Uh, I don't give class notes because the, uh, the reason I felt, I mean, you know, uh, I felt that uh, one of the things students were really interested in at the end of my class was, okay, when are you going to put these notes up on the, um, you know, on the Google Drive or wherever. Uh, and I, uh, most of them, uh, I felt, weren't really paying attention to what I was uh, saying in class because they knew, okay, the notes is always there. Whereas if I say I, I won't give the notes, then it forces students to pay attention in class, it uh, take notes uh, during class. And I think as a neuroscientist, I uh, feel that, you know, the act of writing down helps a bit more with remembering. And this is hopefully, but in my experience, I still like to, when I read a paper, you know, have a uh, version that I can scribble on and, you know, highlight and write on as I'm thinking about what's, uh, what they're trying to tell me in this uh, paper. And finally, I think it's more interactive with students. I make mistakes. I get stuck. I forget. Um, and, you know, I think it uh, helps. Hopefully it makes uh, students feel that, you know, I'm also uh, human and, you know, I'm uh, just as likely as them to make mistakes. The only difference is, I mean, it's just the, you know, uh, difference in age. That's really the only difference. So I hope that, you know, and this is something that uh, another neuroscientist who'd written in eLife about uh, uh, Eve Marder, who had written in eLife about teaching with chalk, uh, said that, uh, you know, uh, students may uh, feel she's more approachable if at the end of the class she's covered with, uh, you know, chalk all over uh, and, you know, just as uh, uh, disheveled as you would be, uh, you know, after teaching with a blackboard. Okay, so quickly in the last slide, I'm going to show an example of one of my, uh, I've been trying to do this with uh, Google Jamboard uh, during the online classes as well. And you can see this is a animal behavior uh, class where I'm basically trying to teach them the circuit that drives a simple reflex in a tadpole. So here are pictures of the tadpole, then here is, you know, the circuit that uh, is involved. And then, uh, you know, I uh, show them what it would be like if you were to record from each of these and you know what uh, happens, etc. And uh, uh, some of the uh, drawbacks for me are my drawing skills are non-existent. But again, I think students have a good laugh at, uh, you know, when I, especially when I'm teaching uh, animal behavior and I, uh, you know, draw a big circle and say, imagine this is a toad, um, etc. 
my handwriting is not great and that was one of the uh, things that i was hesitant about earlier but i find that it's not uh, you know i don't uh, need it to be you know perfect um it requires a bit more practice and organizing things on the board is a challenge that i'm still uh, learning i normally practice my lesson on a sheet of paper uh, beforehand but overall it makes it a lot more uh, fun for me because i really have to understand things and remember and really remember things if i'm uh, to go and you know draw it again on the board or uh, derive something on the board uh, etc uh, and of course i think uh, the final answer is always with the uh, uh, students partly you know what do they think did they really learn anything is something uh, you know i look forward to uh, finding out at the end of the course okay i'm going to stop here and i'll say uh, thank you and again i look forward to you know varied opinions from other people in the panel and i'm happy to answer questions later thank you thank you dr rajan and as i mentioned please if you have comments if you have any questions please start putting them in the chat box because we'll definitely take them up uh, we're moving on to our next panelist and that's dr sujith so i in the beginning i did mention about how an intriguing course is a great way to pique students interest and our next panelist dr sujith is well versed with that thought he teaches a course on robotics and i can imagine the interest that would generate on any campus i'm sure the theory is all very interesting but the challenge would probably lie in involving the students to make it work in real time dr sujith actually uses a hands on approach uh, to the whole idea and now i invite him to take over and, and explain his pedagogical method for his robotics class dr sujith I just had him here. Yes, uh, you're muted, Dr. Sujit. You're still on mute. Yes. Yes. Thanks, Nimla, and uh, yes. thanks to the organizers. So, <clears throat> uh, basically, share the slide? I, yeah, I shared the slides. Is it visible? Uh, no, we're just seeing a blank screen. Mm -hmm. At least I'm seeing. Maybe yes, you can try again. Is it visible now? Uh, not yet. Uh, it's a blank. Oh, it's a black screen. I don't know why. Okay. So, uh, Karen, do you have his slide? If you can, if that's yes. Oh, perfect. yes, we do. Yes, thank, okay. thank you. That's perfect. That helps. So uh, basically, I teach uh, robotics, uh, which is an uh, undergraduate slash graduate kind of a course. and the one of the main things which uh, so before coming to okay before coming to i said i was at triple id delhi so some parts of the teaching is influenced by what pankaj was talking about okay <clears throat> so and next slide so uh, as you already know like typically robotics is um, it's a highly interdisciplinary uh, course um, wherein you can have uh, people from different backgrounds especially on let's say different engineering backgrounds mechanical electrical you have computer science uh, somebody talking about how humans and robots interact which is cs and psychology and then you have some biological people coming in which is some bio inspired robotics so one aspect which i thought would be an interesting given the kind of uh, students that are there at uh, iser which is mainly on electrical engineering and computer science so the focus was mainly on the intelligence building so how i can process or how the robot can process the sensory information and then make the decisions so especially on moving uh, in front of a road or something like that or uh, avoiding obstacles and things like that so apart from the algorithmic part or the the theoretical analysis behind those algorithms one one thing which i wanted to ensure what the students had was on hands on experience to program a robot so typically what i have seen Uh, elsewhere is uh, you either uh, do a theoretical robotics course and then do some simulations and then the end of it so especially when you move from the simulation to the real world the gap is significant because even a small thing that you think that works in a simulation world actually breaks down as soon as you put the coding in on the on a small embedded computer that really works quite slow enough so next slide <coughs> so uh, what we use uh, is uh, basically like this is a small uh, turtle bot uh, which has all the required minimal systems required to ensure that you do an indoor navigation inside a building okay so you want to go around the floor uh, while avoiding an uh, obstacles 
uh, static as well as people moving around so that you don't need to uh, and bump into anybody. So that's like my end objective of the course is wherein people need to implement all the algorithms and these algorithms are what they will be learning in the class. So the idea is that you should be able to understand the algorithm and then implement on a robot. So the details of these algorithms with the theoretical properties, that is what we cover in the class. And then the simulation part, what I do is typically, if you look at this simple uh, block diagram, right? Yeah, uh, you have the controller plant feedback system, and then you drive the error signals out. And the output is what is going to give to the motor signals of your robot, okay? Plant is basically the dynamics and kinematics of the vehicle. The feedback elements are typically the sensory element that gives you. So what I do is inside the class, I just basically like pull only the controller part while the plan, the feedback elements, the rest of the things are pre-given to them so that they don't need to start building up the entire stuff and then they get stuck into the, uh, into the whole body of uh, trying to code everything. So we start with a very, very small part, let's say a simple controller that they do. So I'll just ask them, okay, given a straight line, okay, you need to make sure that the robot is following that straight line, right? A simple controller. It's like a 10 line kind of a code, but that itself is a big challenge when they start to work on the hardware part. Uh, <clears throat> and then the implementation is uh, you do the algorithm, uh, go to the simulation, and then you go to the hardware. So then uh, between the simulation and hardware, there are several uh, iterative loops that get into it, in which case your different algorithms and different concepts that start to play. So here in the first, we are looking at the controller, which is basically tells how your motor should start to move around. So, and then once you start to put the feedback loops, which is basically telling, now I'm getting a sensory input from different sensors, then how should my controller react to that? Right? So then you'll start to have, okay, should I stop my controller? What should be the speed of the controller? Things like that. So when in a simulation world, let's say uh, the, the, you know, the controller can run at 100 uh, hertz, let's assume that. But as soon as they put this controller on a simple uh, embedded computer like an uh, Arduino or uh, basically a Raspberry Pi, the frequency at which you operate starts to reduce a bit. So as soon as the starts to reduce, now they feel that, okay, it is not moving as fast as they want it to be. So now the, there are two things which they want to look at is one, the way in which they have implemented so that can they optimize it better? So use better coding techniques, use better structures, things like that, so that they can speed up the code. And the second thing is, should I change my algorithm to something else so that it can give me the required uh, <coughs> speed at which I can run the algorithm? So these are like, you know, um, these are small, small stuff, which we cannot tell in the theory as such, you know, you should be using such a frequency or anything like that. So these are some things that the student starts to uh, feel it once, as soon as they put their so-called simple code, which it runs perfectly in a simulation world to a real robot world. Okay, so that's where the, you know, the students, uh, okay, some parts is that, uh, they get really uh, frightened when, especially when they do some small mistakes, let's say plus minus or something like that, and the vehicle goes and hits onto the obstacles. They're like, uh, sometimes it breaks, but it's okay. We can always rebuild the uh, system. So that is not a bigger issue, but uh, there is a big of hesitance, especially in the beginning uh, when they want to implement it on a real world system and that is actually moving and something wrong can happen to it. So there is a reverse kind of a feedback, which uh, over time they try to overcome it. Uh, the other thing is, uh, the, and the building of these uh, blocks over time, right? It's like, now initially I give the controller and then they go onto the plant, they change the plant. So now they have a controller and the plant, right? And then the feedback mechanisms that they're using. So let's say that you have a lot of sensors, but sensors have uncertainties into it. So initially they're take, just taking the raw sensors, but then uh, they feel that, okay, after, as soon as they implement the controller that the sensory input is not good. So they need to find the filters. Then we get into the, you know, sensor fusion and estimation algorithms and things like that. And then like this, like we build block by block, but at the initially I give them a, you know, the complete system with having some minimal elements around it. 
so that they can start uh, playing around with uh, each and every element and then slowly get to know the complete system with their interconnections and how each of these uh, elements play along each other so yeah so this has been my uh, um, way of uh, putting especially the robotics class uh, given uh, you know in the, at, at, okay previously i was at triple id delhi where only the engineering students were there so at iser when i came the only science students were there so the way so I, I, only the science okay physics students were there so the way in which their thought process was very different than the engineering way of dealing with things so uh, okay initially i had to retune myself to the way in which they think but then eventually drive them towards to way the actual systems work in an engineering sense uh, yeah but then the second class which is i'm teaching currently now so i have only engineering students over there and then no science students so i have to you know the way in which you approach them is a bit more different so yeah so i had to adapt to way in which the the course goes uh, given the kind of students and their uh, background is So next slide. So and at the end, it, like every class has its own, uh, you know, learnings to be done. So one was initially had a big uh, plan of uh, doing much more uh, uh, research-oriented kind of projects, but in the end, I thought, okay, it's uh, given after first or two classes that the coding skills of the students was not good. So which basically means that. they would take lot of time trying to learn first coding before they can you know implement it on the system so i thought okay instead of uh, giving different different projects to various students i just took one project and then made them intact into a competition kind so i don't have uh, anything else i hope i am intact yeah. i thank can take the yeah thank you dr sachit um, i'm sure that for all of joy for students you know learning the theory to actually making it work in real life that must have been a wonderful challenge and a wonderful day uh, to see it actually happen so thank you for that uh, we actually now move on uh, to our next uh, panelist as educators we are all tasked with the challenge of delivering the material uh, kind of the syllabus if you will but teaching of science has to go a long way beyond just content delivery how do we actually convey the thinking process of science how do we build rationality I now invite Professor Banerjee from ISA Calcutta to share his views on developing rationality and analytical thinking in a science class. Thank you, Professor Nimala. Banerjee. Yes. Uh, Nimal, I want to tell you that today my network is a bit unstable, so if you okay. have difficulty in hearing me, just tell me. I'll then switch my video off. Yes. And if, yes, if you course. still have difficulty, just cut me short and go to the next one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, as uh, Nirmala said at the beginning, uh, most teachers' main job is to content deliver. That means we are supposed to deliver certain things, uh, theorems, theories, lemma, whatever it is that we have to deliver. But actually, the task of a teacher, I believe, is to deliver to the student the process of thinking that science preaches and science preaches a way of thinking that is different from the usual thought process that they call from the society for example they have to learn they have to they have to get rationality through the process of learning in college how do we do that now one of the basic things in irrationality is that one should believe and not question and its antithesis is rationality that means question don't believe and our task then is to give them that sense of doing science question don't believe so we have to sort of foster their questioning mind uh, i do not know what is the situation in other countries people are from other countries also but at least in india i have seen that as students go through school slowly their questioning mind is subsided they accept whatever is taught they accept whatever is written in the textbooks and unquestioning and that is what we have to counter in uh, our courses so how do we do that firstly we have to encourage questioning but that is 
cliche everybody says that more importantly you have to give them a feeling that don't believe even what i'm telling you don't believe even what is there in the textbooks believe only when you get an evidence that is correct so the student should continuously seek evidence initially that does not happen on their own so the teacher has to continuously tell okay i have told you this now tell me what is the evidence that is correct if the student can't answer the teacher has to say that yes it is correct because of this this is the experiment which has shown that this is correct so continuously doing this is necessary especially in the junior classes in college so that the students come out of their believing mind into a question mind uh secondly in college we teach in the textbooks they contain basically what is already known but we know that in science everything is knowable but everything is not known and it is necessary i i not even for not just for the higher classes but even in the first year second year it's necessary for the teacher to tell them this is not known yet while i teach quantum mechanics i tell them that we do not yet know very well how the collapse of a wave function happens what causes it we do not know and the moment to tell them there are things that not not, not only you do not know mankind does not know that excites them they know that there are things to be done instead if you present everything to them in a way that conveys to them that more or less everything is known then it's not exciting for them uh in science what we next we normally do is there's a there's a general theme in science based with a question we formulate a hypothesis or a postulate and then we test the hypothesis of the postulate and all of science is built like that take newton's theory newton's uh, pre newton observations were basically how things move and how planets move those observations were there but newton guessed it is a guess it is a postulate that it is because of a uh, gravitation two bodies attract each other with a definite force it was a postulate it's a guess and then he showed that if this postulate is assumed then i can show why this should happen this is how science teaches you to think test any question you should productively guess an answer and that should be testable answer now a student will face this kind of questions in their own research life but often they are clueless because they have not been uh, accustomed to thinking this way but if you give a problem a situation a imaginary situation in the class that this is what is known on that basis you have the exercise to postulate or hypothesize what could be the reason then that exercise repeatedly done will get them into the habit of thinking uh scientifically whatever they think of whatever hypothesis they build that should be falsified that should not uh it there should be they should be able to conceive some kind of observation or experiment that would falsify their uh, that particular hypothesis it doesn't mean the hypothesis has to be false but in principle falsifiable that also needs to be built in teaching it's possible i've done that i know it's possible in the uh experimental courses an elementary thing that one does has to learn is that any experimental work has to be reproducible so if you have done any experimental work you report in a paper somebody somewhere in the world will try to reproduce that and he should be able to he or she should be able to reproduce that so the experiment even in the first year second year i'm telling you why because normally what happens is that we give them a sheet of instructions this is what you do step number 1 step number 2 step number 3 and write this and submit it this is not the way to conduct a laboratory class because through their laboratory class we have to give them the idea that whatever you get whatever result you obtain has to be reproducible and a you have to do it in such a way so that it is reproducible in such a way so that it is reproducible 
Now, a student may get, may measure a resistance and find a particular value 3.1425. Somebody else somewhere in the world will not get the same value. So how do you then report it in such a way that it is reproducible? Then students understand, okay, that is a requirement for necessity for putting an error bar. How do I find the error bar? How do I accurately write? How do I write all the conditions that went into that experiment? I will not tell them, write this, 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 this. I will tell them, okay, write everything that you can think of that should go into reproducing this experiment. So uh, this is how I naturally try to uh, treat this. The whole idea is to, to give them an idea about the method of science. It is not just content delivery. The content, the theory, the theorems, they can read a book and find out. But through interaction with the teacher, the student should be able to understand how science teaches us to think. Once we inherit that thinking process, the rest can be learned at any time. Especially, I personally feel that the, the detailed things that we teach in relatively higher level courses, these may not be necessary for everybody. This may be necessary only for the person who's doing a research in that area. The others, might uh, simply read up if they need it. The fundamentals, the basic things are prerequisites for the advanced courses. This should be taught, but the focus should always be this. Science believes in causality. Nothing happens without a cause. And all the discoveries that has happened in science has happened in trying to find the cause of something. So the student should understand that there's something called causality and uh, how does it work? How does it work in different areas of science? And finally, I would say that there are two ways of thinking, subjective way of thinking and objective way of thinking. And science has shunned the object subjective way and it has accepted the objective method of thinking. How does it work in science? How does it work? How, how, how do you what do we understand by a subjective way of thinking in the things that I'm teaching and a objective way of thinking in the things that I'm teaching? How can a student distinguish between them? An experiment, for example, in biology, why do we have a double blind experiment? To eliminate the chances of subjective, what are known as confirmation bias. Unfortunately, these are not conveyed properly that in order to avoid my own subjective beliefs, we have to take certain precautions in science and uh, yeah, double blind experiments, providing a placebo to the control group and all that, all these are built into the scientific method because of this. So what I'm trying to convey is that uh, it is necessary for us teachers, not only to, to deliver the content, the course content, the syllabus, certain things have to be taught. But I feel more important is that, is how we convey this. How we convey this, the way we convey this, that should imbibe them with the method of science, the idea of how science teaches us to think. Uh, I'll stop here because I'm not sure if I'm probably <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Banerjee. I'm sure you've given us a lot to think about and uh, to all the people who are attending here, a lot to ponder when they go back to teach again. So now we move on again and into something in interdisciplinary work. We all understand that the way forward in education is interdisciplinary work, uh, both in teaching and research. This was something our plenary speaker, Professor Jalodi, actually spoke about today. So how do we tackle the challenges we face as we bridge departments fields of study and still convey the message. To answer these questions, let's turn over to our next panelist, Professor Dennis C. Free from ENS Paris, who will share his thoughts on interdisciplinary teaching at the Department of Biology at ENS. Uh, Professor Dennis? I, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. So let me share my screen. Yes, please. Um, yeah, do you see? This one. My yes. slide, so full screen. Yes, please. Perfect. Yes. Um, just one thing, maybe to move down. Okay. So um, I want to introduce ourselves a, a little bit about uh, 
some of the key lessons that uh, we have built up over the, the last decades about uh, teaching biology, in particularly uh, biology as it is uh, evolving, uh, in particular um, uh, being uh, more and more quantitative, having to face uh, big data challenge and so on. Um, yeah, so um, there are maybe four main principles underlying our teaching at ENS in general, and in particular in, in the biology department. The first one is training to and through research, so trying to involve students as soon as possible into the, the practice of research. I have to say that we start to teach uh, to students uh, only at the level of the third university years. So it makes maybe a difference with uh, our colleagues uh, in India. The other thing is uh, interdisciplinarity in general. Uh, one very important point is the flexibility in the curriculum. And then the last one is personalized uh, mentoring. So I am going to show one slide per uh, uh, each of these, uh, for each of these components, starting with training to and our research. So in practice, uh, we start by a, a year-long experimental immersion during the first year, so corresponding to the third university year. Uh, then we have a long internship, uh, full second semester uh, during uh, the second year, corresponding to the first year of master. And this internship most often is uh, done abroad for students. And then we have, an, again, a long internship uh, covering the full second semester in the third year, corresponding to Master 2, most often in Fran France, because it is the step towards the PhD. But in some cases, our students also uh, envision to do their uh, second year of master internship abroad, and sometimes also the PhD abroad. And on top of that, because of uh, the increasing importance of uh, data analysis and so on in biology, we have a computational biology project uh, every year available to students, uh, more on uh, some kind of optional basis. Uh, and usually they are facing uh, real uh, challenge, uh, not just uh, very uh, well-prepared exercise. They have to try to reproduce published data, this kind of thing. Now, one important thing also is that they are able to uh, interrupt their normal courses and take a gap year, uh, in particular, to uh, do uh, additional internship, but not only, I will come back to that. Now, coming back into uh, in this interdisciplinarity, uh, first, it, it should be considered as, uh, within biology itself, because uh, biology is pretty wide uh, in, in our department. We teach uh, molecular cell and developmental biology, but also neuroscience, genomics, evolution, ecology, computational biology, and so on. And there are many possible combinations that make sense. Uh, and so we try to um, uh, let the students uh, to define uh, their own uh, curriculum uh, using uh, what we can offer them. Um, we have also courses of mathematics and physics that are specially uh, uh, devised, uh, designed for uh, biology students. Uh, uh, and uh, reciprocally, we have also biology courses that are designed for non-biologists so to attract students from other disciplines towards biology. And uh, another aspect of interdisciplinarity is the connection with medicine. And so we recruit medical students from level M1 upward. And this makes also very interesting interaction within promotions. Um, and finally, uh, students have access to courses from other ENS departments and from other uh, PSL institutions, provided that they, they could get a, a sufficient background. And sometimes they uh, use the gap years to complete this background uh, in other disciplines. Um, regarding curriculum flexibility, uh, on the one hand, we have a very wide uh, teaching offer. Uh, 
ENA students in general can change their focus uh, across their studies. So for example, they may be enrolled in one department at the beginning and, and then they may decide to change of departments uh, later on. They have access to uh, minors uh, in other disciplines and they can use these gap years again uh, to complete uh, their training in uh, other uh, disciplines. And they can decide when uh, to take it uh, after the first year, L3, or we, uh, in between the two master years, or even uh, when just before the PhD thesis. We have also double diploma. I will not go into the details, but with engineering schools. Um, and uh, uh, we have also um, now uh, a new, uh, two new um, graduate programs that try to uh, improve the connection between uh, the undergrad and the graduate studies, so between the master in particular and, and the PhD studies, uh, with a, a grant uh, system for foreign students. Now, switching to mentoring, uh, each in a student is attributed a, a tutor uh, who will help the students to, to decide which course to follow uh, and so on. And this tutor may change uh, if the student is changing focus, for sure. We have also a double tutoring system for students that are engaged into uh, multidisciplinary studies. Uh, and um, normally the students uh, meet uh, their tutor several times over the year, in particular to discuss the study plans in due time, and also uh, to select the internship laboratories. And uh, in addition now, uh, in our uh, institute, uh, PIs uh, will uh, add an, a further layer of tutoring more oriented to research. And we try to then assign uh, tutors that are very close in terms of uh, research interest to the, to the student. So my last slide is just to say very briefly, uh, what was the impact of COVID and of the uh, confinement on our teaching uh, practice uh, in some kind of resonance with some previous talks. So the first thing is that we, we had to develop teaching at distance and we mainly use GoToMeeting and Big Blue Button. Uh, we had also to develop more systematic online resources and we use mainly uh, Moodle for that. And this proved to be something that we really want to keep uh, later on. Uh, we use chat channels and uh, we realized that we had to diversify our teaching mode. So I uh, spend less time giving ex cathedra lectures and more time trying to get students more actively involved. Um, and uh, in the particular case of internships that proved to be uh, at some point uh, very complicated, we had to uh, replace them sometimes by data analysis projects and or grant writing. Um, during the, uh, the confinement period. And uh, one thing that turned out to be very important in, is our tutoring, which be, uh, was then transferred online, but with, uh, which helped us to uh, support the students uh, to go across uh, the difficulties encountered. And that's it. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Tifri. Yeah, if you can uh, unshare, stop sharing your slides. Uh, Thank you, panelists. And the question now is, what can make learning math a fun experience? How great would it be if we can actually break the mold on didactic teaching in this fundamental subject? So how nice would it be if students get together to solve problems in an active learning environment? A panelist, Dr. Venkat from Isa Tirupati, will now share his experiences of implementing learning in a mind. Uh, yes, can you hear me, Nirmala? Yes, I can. Oh, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So, just a moment, I'll just uh, share my screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, I can. Okay, so 
yeah. So my internet is also very unstable today. So if my video goes off, or yeah, just let me you know. I will stop the uh, video and then just uh, speak. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, am I seen now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I hope it's already uh, afternoon in France. Uh, uh, I uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to be part of this meeting on exchange of practices on education and pedagogical approaches, and particular to this panel discussion. So, in this discussion, I'd like to share with you my experience of teaching mathematics, especially to large classes with uh, non-homogeneous population of uh, students. Okay, so let me just go to the presentation. Uh, so first, let me try to bring in the context of this uh, of this uh, talk, where uh, we deal with uh, students uh, from uh, the undergraduate classes uh, of ISER. Uh, in the ISER curriculum, uh, we have a unique model, you know, where uh, students have to study mathematics as a compulsory subject um, in the first two years of their program, even if they might have discontinued studying of mathematics after high school. So uh, typically we have a class of let's say 150 to 200 students uh, and where in some cases even more than half of the population uh, have not studied mathematics for the past two years of their life. Some of them have even given up uh, mathematics entirely thinking that they will not take it up later. And uh, the impression that many students have about mathematics when they enter the undergraduate program from their collective experience uh, is similar to someone who has completed high school is that uh, mathematics consists of a collection of uh, you know uh, you know some some ideas some problems some solutions always it is about equations or you know uh, so, so solving some problem etc cetera, etc cetera. and mostly numerically and uh, when you utter the word math as dr chandrashil uh, pointed out in his lecture you know he's not going to show any equations or formulas so that's the impression that people generally have about mathematics most of you would have also observed and also agree uh, starting from the school level, starting from the school level, mathematics seems to be a difficult subject for many students from your experience with maybe your, uh, uh, you know, uh, friends or, you know, your uh, children, if you have children or your students whom you are mentoring who are in other disciplines, but not necessarily mathematics, they might have come and shared with you the difficulty of uh, encountering mathematics. So this continues even after high school. And especially when it comes to the abstract nature of the subject, uh, it presents additional difficulties to most of the students, um, especially those students who have not had mathematics in their high school and then come to the ISO systems, those students really think that they are at a disadvantage to begin with. So it is in this context that I wish to discuss uh, some methods uh, of active learning that I have tried to use in my own experience to encounter these uh, challenges which are offered uh, uh, in this context. So, right? So um, in a large class, what is uh, typically difficult is that, you know, because of this uh, heterogeneous nature of the population just coming to our class, uh, we have to first of all remove the fear of math, open up the mind of the students and encourage, encourage them to think originally and, and build confidence in them. This, I think this is one of the aims when I go into an undergraduate class, especially the first two years of our, of our program. And the teacher should also keep in mind that students who already are you know, uh, have shown an aptitude in mathematics or who, have, uh, who are confident of doing mathematics, they should. They are also in the same class and our approach should be kind of a mixed nature so that we are dealing with both these populations simultaneously. So the first thing, uh, as Dr. Samantha Banerjee pointed out in this uh, wonderful talk, uh, one has to uh, ask students to, you know, we have to make students to think. And the only way uh, to make them think is to kind of trying to aid them with questions and giving them time so that they will start thinking. And uh, usually what typically happens in a classroom is that you pose a question as a teacher and then immediately, depending on the nature of the question, I mean, usually we ask obvious leading simple questions and depending on the nature of the questions, immediately there are answers. And then there are a bunch of students ranging from a few to, you know, maybe 10 or 15 who would always give you the answer you know, uh, very quickly so that a thinking opportunity is denied for other students. So as a rule in my undergraduate classes, I say that I will give you a question, but then I give you time to think. And even if you have an answer ready, please keep it with you. I will give you time to tell your answer. 
so in a live classroom pre covid i used to walk around and look at some notebooks uh, few notebooks say that you know how is the thinking process going how are they thinking what are their answers etc and then give them opportunity to answer so if a teacher does this consistently over a period of time they have trust on you and even those students who were not really thinking or they were just expecting their friends to answer the questions they start thinking with you and they develop or cultivate this habit of real time thinking in the class along with the teacher so this is one one uh, method that uh, uh, i employ and the second second thing is that this doesn't mean that we discourage students from asking questions or answering we do really give them time but the, the, there's a little bit thinking time depending on the nature of the question 30 seconds 1 minute etc to really uh, you know have the time for their thinking and this especially is important in the beginning part of a course once you are through with one third or half of your course and you know that the students are thinking with you then you can slowly bring down this thinking time because they are now with you thinking all, all the time so this is one uh, one point and uh, usually when you ask a question also by using the sample population one can gauge how their thinking is going sometimes the question you have posed is hard so that you will have to ask a simpler question which they can answer and uh, so on building this uh, thinking process by asking these leading questions so secondly uh, yes or no questions are a good good place to begin with but yes or no questions are just not sufficient for our purposes because uh, it is very important to develop creative thinking in any science especially in mathematics uh, so one has to think of giving them some good ideas and then you know uh, having them giving them time to develop and then be creative so this is the second point and uh, many students uh, you know who are in my class they are majority of our students go and do biology chemistry physics and then they come to math so if you look at the number of students who typically choose uh, you know they are major after the two years of studying the large majority of students go to biology and chemistry because of the nature of the subject very attractive experimental uh, research and so on and then to physics and then to math so uh, they think that mathematics is some kind of magic you no know, the teacher comes uh, writes a statement of the theorem proves it and then oh wonderful it's how it is done so basically we have to tell them the way uh, you know in which how we do our for mathematics this is very very beautifully brought out by dr chandrachit in his talk regarding taking the uh, cue from the uh, research and then putting it back to the teaching so examples are the experiments of a mathematician examples are done we observe pattern and then we when, then we theorize so even in the classroom when we are going to present a theory or a theorem we have to build that with the aid of examples good examples typical examples have to be built and based on these examples one has to ask them to observe you know the patterns and based on these patterns one has to formulate theorems if it is done this way probably even those students who find mathematics unattractive or difficult you know may get a you know a feel of doing it and then even may choose to do mathematics later and uh, third thing is that the main roadblock in mathematics is mathematical proofs so every time uh, when i teach an undergraduate course usually i get few students who come to my office and tell me that uh, you know i haven't had any math i don't understand how to do this proof what is this proof so the math, writing out mathematical proofs is a major roadblock in in teaching undergraduate classes with a heterogeneous population so to deal with such issues usually uh, one has to try to teach the theorems in a upside way down like you know a textbook typically writes a theorems proof so as to say pages etc you know there are a lot of constraints others so a, a theorems proof is built and then it is written in certain certain way as a teacher we have to try and give them an opportunity to think how this proof could have been conceived so depending on the subject and the topic and the depth of the theorem and the difficulty of the proof uh, there are many 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 ways of doing it but because of the shortage of time i think uh, i will not go into details because uh, of the nature of the audience also so mathematical proofs also when you deal with some of them could be very simple uh, proofs just checking something checking some axioms that something is holding some proofs require many many steps or they may they may have some ideas and these ideas could also be repeated in other subjects or other topics uh, or you know uh, 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 recurring recurring themes so whenever these recurring themes comes etc one has to try and emphasize that so that they they kind of recognize it and then keep it in their mind for usage later so uh, this is one way and when really deep theorem comes as a teacher as professor samitra banerji pointed out you have to admit i have admitted for example that i do not know how this proof was conceived 
this is brilliant that this person did the proof and we can only verify how the proof was conceived or you know uh, we cannot really give an idea of upside down thought how this proof could have been conceived by him so uh, various uh, aspects about uh, proofs and uh, finally a word about uh, consolidation via exercises so many of us most of us who have done math know that you know an integral part of mathematics is to solve problems but when you solve problems you are asked okay solve this solve that this is a typical problem that comes in your mind when you say mathematical problems on the other hand in abstract mathematics many of the exercises or problems involve giving proofs of statements or verifying something so what i usually do uh, in the undergraduate class is that rather than trying rather than telling them that look this is true you prove it uh, one can actually build a sequence of problems and make this rather than you know saying it as a, as a uh, rather than being didactic there you can just say that you know with is it true is it true that this holds or you know uh, can you see some pattern here can you come up with a statement on your own if you can bring up something like that originally and and break a big big uh, exercise into sequence of smaller exercises do have a, so that they have a joy of discovery in that so they will think that they actually came up with a Uh, statement statement of the theorem and then i will usually ask them to verify it so if you have formulated if you observe some pattern and you have formulated your statement then please give a proof of it and usually these exercises are used in the course uh, later all my exercises usually or most of my exercises uh, which i which i put in an undergraduate uh, worksheet usually will be used in the later part of the course and uh, this is one way of uh, making them uh, you know uh, think along with you and uh, removing the fear in their minds and then uh, making them very active while learning and have a productive uh, you know experience so that when they go to other subjects later uh, many many of us have to realize that it is not the mathematics mathematical theorems or the results or the uh, the proofs that matter the actual thing which matters is the way of thinking mathematics has its own way of thinking and that way of thinking is very useful in many sciences not just sciences even outside sciences so this is what i try to inculcate i mean some points um, uh, in my courses so uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity then i would like to stop here yeah thanks so uh, all right uh, we are done with our panelists but uh, we are really running out of time so my plan is to consolidate all that questions that we saw and the messages that i received and trying to put together as a couple of questions that our panelists can take uh, so i do want to mention a lot of people um, actually mentioned they liked the idea of going back to the chalkboard which is very nice uh, though they did have some questions if you can tackle chalkboard as well as powerpoints together uh, when you're giving such a talk is that something you want to answer professor hazra and uh, rajin if you're there i think they're connecting Yeah, shall I take that? Yes, please, please do. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so again, that's I think a, a question of at least in our uh, uh, lecture hall, the main uh, thing with doing that is the projector screen and the blackboard are uh, over one over the other. Um, so you know you have to uh, switch off the room lights for <laughs> the projector so that uh, things. Right. Are, it's a technical uh, issue. Technical issue. yeah but it's uh, i i have done it uh, in some classes you know sometimes it's easier to go uh, explain things on the blackboard uh, you know in parallel with a slide somebody right. wants to add something to that yeah amrita just came back uh, yeah uh, no, so I, uh, i think raghav you're, you're fine yeah exactly that uh, let's move on nirmala right. yeah uh, a couple of questions uh, actually this is out to dr somitro banerjee Uh, a couple of them have kind of gotten back to the same point that how do you actually translate what you said into a real class because sometimes asking so many questions to students can get a little tiresome for them and the practicality of actually doing all of this and considering the fact we have to cover so much of concepts within a course within a specified amount of time can be pretty taxing so do you have some answer for that professor banerjee uh, well i must admit that this what i have said i normally do in a regular class where i can see the students and their eyes uh this has not been very successful in the online mode of teaching because i can't see them when i ask question suddenly there is silence and i don't know whether they're perplexed or they're thinking i don't know but in the class at least in the first few classes i get them primed onto this mode of thinking don't accept what i am telling don't accept always question always doubt and accept only when you see some evidence that this is true either a logical uh, derivation 
that therefore it is true or some kind of experimental evidence you ask them in the class if you do that in the first few classes i suppose they get primed down to that mode of thinking and uh, i found that that doesn't require to be done every time you teach something yes it is true that in order to cover a course you cannot do that every time it's true but the message has to be given right up front that's my strategy okay perfect that makes sense so in the interest of time we don't do it for every class but we try to encourage that sort of thing thinking uh, in the students uh, the other major question i had was uh, especially considering with all the pandemic uh, how do we actually deliver these best practices to a wide spectrum of students students who come with different backgrounds with different aptitudes different challenges how do we manage to get across all of this to this wide variety anybody can take it from our panel anybody wants to answer I'm not sure who will answer. Yeah, I mean, I I just opened it up because this is not specific to any subject. Uh, and if you if you want to go ahead, please answer, Dr. Banerjee. Uh, well, uh, every class has a uh, has a diversity depending on the background, depending on the level of the students, and I normally address the lower half, and that includes, suppose I'm teaching a physics class and I have. in the class if quite a few students who have not done mathematics at the uh, class 2 level so i have to i know that i have to teach at that level and so therefore i address uh, that way. the the upper half would sometimes think that it's not being very interesting but i have to carry the whole class this is the problem typically of larger classes yes and my my strategy is to address the you know if this is the whole range i address something like two thirds at the bottom anybody else wants to pitch in or uh, i mean specifically yes. for the for the in with regard to the pandemic and uh, the use of uh, you know online resources mm -hmm. uh, what i have done is uh, just practically i have uh, uh, sort of waived all timeline based uh, things so generally i'll give them a very generous timeline for submitting assignments or anything that might be graded or e even anything that might not be graded uh, so that you know they can get to it at their own times also i've been i think just being very flexible with vivas and things like that have helped them to take their time to assimilate information uh, because it's just such a different mode of learning right now so i think uh, that uh, is specific to the pandemic teaching and i i completely agree with dr banerjee that uh, addressing the class uh, where everybody can get it is perhaps a better approach overall yes yes exactly all right I guess we've covered, tried to cover at least some of the stuff, and I know we are running out of time. Some participants have had to leave because of time issues. So at this point, I would like to put together what we have learned in this panel discussion. It was a very interesting time with all of you, and we've seen that not one method actually works, right? We've seen a whole variety of uh, methodologies adapted for different uh, groups of students, different subjects, depending as the case might be. And so that's probably the first lesson we've learned today that you have to choose something that works for your particular course, for your particular region, particular country. It could be something where you're going down, write, uh, writing down to a, on a blackboard, using a digital device, or doing active learning when you have students in class. All of this does work when you have students in front of you it's a face to face class the challenges do change when we switch to an online mode which i'm sure we'll be discussing in more great detail tomorrow uh, but what i have learned personally from this is uh, try to look around try to hear methods try to check out different things uh, be brave to try out new things uh, be uh, welcoming to new ideas and you will find something that will suit you uh, to your specific mode of teaching and sometimes as uh, dr sujit also mentioned what you teach one year might not be exactly relevant the next year they you might face different challenges with the same course depending on the students so we have to keep our minds open to that so keeping in mind our diversity the challenges that our students face and that we face with different subjects we have to keep an open mind and use different techniques and hopefully have a great time teaching so we have to mute it that's funny yes we do have to we have to keep changing every year every time and i can say that from personal experience it seems like i learn something every day when i teach my students i never consider myself i'm done with this it's amazing what they bring to the table too and as long as we have that open mind i think uh, we can all
or make a success out of this. So with that, I would like to thank the organizers for all of this and giving me a chance to conduct the panel. Uh, I want to specifically thank all the panelists. You've, you guys have been awesome. Uh, I've been able to reach all of you and work together uh, to arrange this great event. I want to thank all the participants and ask questions and be part of this. And now I'll turn it over uh, to Professor Ambika. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nirmala, for your very interesting role as moderator. We could see a diverse variety of teaching methods based on subjects, based on their personal experiences, etc. Certainly for all of us, it was a very interesting and lively session. Now I thank all the panelists also for, for who joined this session. So I think now we are coming to the end of a very lively and interactive session of the first day. To sum up and formally conclude the session, I would like to invite Dr. Harinath Chakrapani and again Dr. Amrita Hasra from ISA Pune. Dr. Harinath Chakrapani is professor in the Department of Chemistry and he is also the Dean of International Relations and Outreach in ISA Pune. After joining ISA Pune in 2009, he was faculty in charge of the Science Media Center for four years and he was actively involved in teaching and research. His research interests are basically in drug delivery. Along with him, to summarize and conclude the session today, we have Amrita Hasra. She, has already, she was already introduced to you. She was one of the panelists in the just concluded panel discussion. So we have actually seen her enthusiasm in teaching and developing new methods of teaching at the undergraduate and the master's level and experimenting with teaching techniques in the class. And I would, but anyway, I would like to mention an additional thing that is she has taught guest lectures at ENS Leon and she has hosted an ENS Leon faculty member as part of her chemical biology course. So now I invite Harinath and Amrita to formally conclude today's session with their summary and comments. Over to you, Harinath. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Ambika. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, great. See, uh, so, uh, you know, a couple of years back when we all met in, uh, in ENS uh, Leon, uh, you know, we decided to have a joint workshop on a topic uh, that is really close to all of all of our hearts, which is uh, teaching. You know, I understand that uh, all our institutes are actually research heavy and, you know, we do take our research uh, very seriously. Uh, but uh, we, teaching is an important part of our portfolio. And there are quite a few uh, of us who are very interested. So this meeting uh, on uh, teaching and pedagogy was supposed to happen in person. Uh, you know, we were uh, going to invite and host uh, our French colleagues uh, here in India. Oh, you got muted, Harinath. Please, unmute. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this meeting was supposed to happen uh, uh, in person uh, in India, but uh, that did not happen. Uh, but but the pandemic happened, and because of the pandemic. Uh, uh, you know, we decided to conduct this workshop uh, online. And uh, as you can see, there's a lot of enthusiasm and interest among the panelists. You know, we have uh, all ISAs represented in this and all ENS is represented. So it's, it's a really wonderful forum for us to get together. And, uh, you know, as Ambika mentioned, uh, we already have a, a, a course that, you know, a couple of our uh, colleagues are, are teaching together. And uh, while we were in, uh, in in France, you know, we discussed the possibility of having joint courses. Uh, so this is very important because uh, you know we don't we don't have a, a whole lot of time zone difference. You know, a few hours here and there. So we should be able to adjust our our uh, schedules so that we can uh, have joint courses. Uh, and of course, this was before the pandemic. Now, with a lot of asynchronous learning uh, coming into into the picture, I think we should uh, all work hard and try to see if we can facilitate this. If this involves uh, doing credit transfers or doing uh, you know credit sharing, we should do that, and that's the way that uh, both our organizations or both our all our, our, our organizations will benefit. So, with that, uh, I look forward to uh, a lively session tomorrow as well, and I'll hand it over to Amrita for uh, concluding remarks. Thank you, Amrita. Can you take over? Hello? Amrita, you are there? Uh, Professor Ambika, I think she had some electricity issues. She just uh, messaged okay. me. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if she can get back on. 
but she just mentioned electricity's gone up there so she's having some issues at her end so, so i think ambika you can we can just conclude uh, and oh. we'll meet again tomorrow okay yeah okay then cedric shall we conclude the session then yes i think it's time to to conclude okay. and uh, and to thank all the participants uh, and the speakers today we're yeah. very glad uh, you can participate and we looking forward to meeting uh, you again tomorrow okay thanks to all of you we conclude today's session and we hope to meet you all tomorrow so see you tomorrow bye see you bye thank you bye thank you bye